Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 85 being recorded on Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. With me are about 47 people in the chat at twitch.tv slash socialism S4A. We do these streams um, about, well, once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes we skip a week, but usually it is Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, and we go for a few hours. I'm not sure how long I'm going to go today because um, my energy level is pretty good. However, I'm a bit under the weather this week. Uh, kind of got a sinus thing going on. And anyway, I'll, I'll go for as long as I can today. But we have a few articles pulled that I want to get through. Uh, namely, one short thing on COVID, a study showing that COVID-19 rates were likely 40 times higher than CDC estimates during the BA4, BA5 period uh, last summer and fall. Of course, now we're in the XBB period. So, you know, new strains coming in every few months, try and keep up. <clears throat> also, just a quick note about the H5N1 bird flu. After that, we're going to look at a story about chemical accidents in the United States in this era of neoliberal defunding, deregulate deregulation and privatization. Um, that deregulation is leading to all kinds of accidents. Companies don't have to uh, be as careful with what they're doing because there just aren't rules governing what they have to do, etc., etc. But we're averaging about two um, industrial accidents a day. So we'll read an article about that. Beyond that, within the sort of communist milieu, uh, we're going to read some articles, this just kind of came about randomly today, um, about CPUSA. I had somebody DMing me asking me about CPUSA's, quote, Bill of Rights Socialism, and then I happened across another article about it in Cosmonaut as well, and I had an article from Politsturm uh, criticizing CPUSA as well, so we might as well discuss that, actually. Um, so that's going to be, we had four articles on that. So that's kind of the overview of what we've got, um, you know, picked out today. And of course, as usual, we're going to start with the chat. So yeah, there's like between 40 and 50 people here. Let me go up to the top of today's chat, if Twitch will let me. I'm trying to grab the little slider bar and it's not, there it is, finally. All right. All right. I'm trying to find the top. Okay, here's the new stuff. Here's the new stuff. All right. I had to have a tooth pulled since it was rotting out of my head and the antibiotics are fucking my stomach up. If only I could have afforded to have my teeth checked regularly. Yeah, as we were mentioning, teeth in the United States are um, a class indicator because they are treated separately from other kinds of... Uh, you know, health, even if you have medical insurance, which, you know, is probably going to be coming through an employer and is expensive, uh, dental is not necessarily covered. Now, you can, in many cases, find a dentist who will have fairly reasonable rates out of pocket. Um, you know, that is, if you don't have insurance, you can just pay uh, out of your own pocket. And, you know, I mean, definitely get your cleanings, get your checkups, get your x-rays, because with dental stuff, um, you know, truly an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure because once, you know, your adult teeth, there's a problem. I mean, they're the only teeth you've got. So it is key. But, um, yeah, there was a meme I saw at one point where it was like, uh, something healthcare except teeth, teeth are magic mouth bones that only the rich can afford. Um, but yeah, so, you know, when you see someone with, um, obvious dental problems, missing teeth, etc. It tends to be a class indicator. You know, in a socialist uh, USA, we would certainly not have that be a situation so much anymore. So, um, yeah. But it, it's, this is another uh, another thing about dental problems. They're enormously <clears throat> painful. The mouth is a very sensitive area. There's a lot of nerve endings. And this is for good reason. Your teeth are crucial for chewing your food, which, you know, you have to take multiple times a day. It's the source of your uh, physical nutrition. 
And so when there's a problem with one of your teeth, your body really, really lets you know that there's a problem with your teeth on a pretty much constant, you know, uh, high volume basis. So um, for people who have dental problems and are homeless, for example, this is a big contributor to alcoholism, people um, drinking alcohol to numb the dental pain. So we just had universal dental care. Um, obviously not everybody would take full advantage of it. There are genetic factors as far as how much your teeth remineralize on like an ongoing basis. Uh, people have different you know, hygiene habits and things like that. But overall, the bar would be um, raised a lot higher. Anyway, bottom line, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. And uh, antibiotics definitely can do that. Uh, remember to take some probiotics after you get done with the run of antibiotics. And, um, you know, some raw fermented foods, or you can just get like a probiotic supplement, uh, yogurt, things like that. That really helps. Your gut microbiome is really important. Those are all the microorganisms that live in your intestines, and they don't just help digest food. They um, participate in all kinds of biochemical processes, creating neurotransmitters, all kinds of things. Um, I mean, your, your gut microbiome creates a lot of serotonin, for example, and it can cross the blood-brain barrier. So really, really important stuff. We did an article a while ago about how um, the gut microbiome from mice who were infected, was it mice or humans, infected with, um, with COVID, because COVID attacks the gut and the gut microbiome pretty significantly. The gut microbiome from infected I believe it was mice, was transferred to germ-free mice, and the germ-free mice developed long COVID symptoms just from having that, um, that microbiome. Uh, so not even the virus itself, but just the bacterial profile that um, was created uh, by the COVID. Anyway, continuing. Why not simultaneous stream both here and YouTube? Uh, too many, I like to keep the chat smaller so that I can actually respond to all the, um, you know, comments. We can have an actual discussion. If I did this on YouTube, I don't know how many people would show up, but I think it would be a lot, a lot more. Plus, I'm just used to Twitch at this point, and yeah, there's no need to do it. I, po I post these on YouTube later anyway. Let's see. Uh, I lead an educational in my study group, and I can't help but think that I'm kind of shit at it. Any tips on how to get better? Well, what do you feel that you're not doing well? So there's probably things that you are doing well, and then maybe things that could stand to be improved. Um, what is it that you feel like you're struggling with? Hey, Maria, thank you for the compliments on the stream. Try to have a good one again. And I want to thank everybody who shows up in the comments. There's a lot of regulars who are here pretty much every time. And, you know, we get a relationship going that way. There's an ongoing dialogue. You all help to make these streams what they are. I'm facilitating. I'm obviously dropping in with what knowledge I have and picking articles and reading those. But you all help this thing to keep going. Um, it, you know, if this was just me, it would be a dramatically different thing. Sad day for Greece today. Train crash, 43 dead, 55 in hospital, 20 to 25 still missing. Mostly young people, university students, another privatization, quote, miracle. Neoliberalism at its, quote, best. Yeah, I mean, and people really need to understand this is the future that faces us. The neoliberal agenda... I mean, just to break down what is neoliberalism real quick, uh, there have kind of been three major phases of capitalism uh, in, in a United States timeline. You had uh, early capitalism, you know, overthrowing feudalism, separating from uh, the British crown, etc., cetera, um, coming into its own as a power, the capitalists. And that eventually sort of culminated into robber baron capitalism, you know, late 
1800s, early 1900s, when there was a big push uh, either for revolution, for reform, whatever. There was massive pushback. And so, you know, of course you get um, revolution in the Russian Empire, 1917. You get different uh, waves of revolution and progressive reform. Overall, the uh, effect is, you know, revolution in some countries and at least massive reforms in other countries. This gives way to the era where capitalism hung on and wasn't overthrown in a revolution, to the era of social democracy. Lots of regulations, lots of public programs, still capitalism, but it's there's more of a cushion for workers to, uh, you know, the ups and downs of capitalism. There's at least some padding for people to land on. Um, and this was one of the ways that capitalism competed with socialism, uh, trying to be appealing, trying to make concessions to workers rather than just uh, completely being overthrown. That was the strategy that the capitalists ran for a while because they felt that they had to. And a number of decades passed. In the 1970s, the capitalist class collectively decided it was in their class interest to attempt a new strategy, basically throw all of the social democratic stuff out the window and just cut to the bone. This was neoliberalism neoliberal there's other uh re-liberalizing and going back to that unregulated laissez-faire you know robber baron capitalism and we're now 45 ish years into that you could say it really started with reagan as far as the unveiling of the vision really being sold overtly to the people however uh there were overtures made to neoliberalism throughout the 70s as this um class project of the capitalists was developed. So yeah, it's defund public programs, privatize everything that they can, and deregulate what's been privatized as well. And so you get industrial accidents and, you know, in the United States, about 1,200 train derailings a year. Not all of them involve hazmat spills and explosions, but we don't need to be having that. You know, this is deregulation and basically letting their system go to shit, um, doing the bare minimum. Uh, I think in part because they fear stoking the flames of class struggle um, if they you know, are to push um, more modern advanced development further, um, it can you know, re-inflame the fight for wages and conditions because it puts the proletariat in a better position. So they're sort of riding this neo-feudalist line at this point to go as reactionary as possible and try to drag uh, as much proletarian consciousness as they can with it. So we're in a pretty desperate state right now, but um, you know there is a growing movement for socialism. We're doing the education, and there are various groups in sort of pre-party formations to get a movement going again, sort of clear out the revisionism that... Um, you know, leftovers of 20th century revisionism, clear that out, get new parties uh, going, revitalize the movement. That's the kind of thing uh, I would like to see. So a bill passed in the House Foreign Affairs Committee to ban TikTok in the U.S. Coincidence they do this now that people are using it to expose their disaster in Ohio. Yeah, I mean, TikTok is not the problem. Um, there are various really annoying things about social media of all types, but I mean, there's YouTube short, like, there's all this stuff. I, I happen to think TikTok, as video goes, ten is like pretty terrible. I don't like watching two or three minute clips of things. I feel like it's... Um, just the format that of most of the TikToks, it raises a lot of questions and then is unable to answer them. I feel like that is the sort of the typical TikTok video. They sort of get people going watching them, but there's no resolution. There's no closing to any of the videos. And I don't know, I find it to be just kind of aggravating, <laughs> like massively irritating to watch these videos that all they sort of do is agitate and there's no sort of conclusion to them at all. Um, but that you know that's not a reason to ban it. It's all this sort of uh, Cold War with China stuff, 
And, uh, you know, this is this is the stage that we're in. Capitalism is struggling to stay afloat and they are trying all kinds of tactics uh, to divert people's attention from the class struggle. And so, you know, banning TikTok, etc. cetera, um, it goes on. Do you know the estimate of people having long COVID around the world? I know that there are over 100 million people having long COVID, but I wanna know what I think the number is. Well, we know that it's, I mean, it depends on how you define long COVID because there are different definitions of it as far as having symptoms four weeks after infection, 12 weeks after infection, it's defined differently. However, no matter how you slice it, um, those estimates come in between five and 25%. So I would guess around 15% of cases um, people are having some kind of consistent problems um, for sometimes up to a year, sometimes longer than that. Some of the things don't really seem to resolve ever. Other things do seem to resolve after some period of time, that period of time often being like nine to 12 months. Um, but it depends. There's a lot of cardiac events going on. People dying from heart attacks in their 40s, 50s. Uh, there was that actor, Tom Sizemore, did a lot of like 90s stuff. And um, he just had like a terminal stroke at 61. He, he's not dead yet. I just saw this headline last night. Uh, and I'm like, oh, 61. That's pretty young to be having like that kind of a severe stroke. But he probably had COVID. I mean, uh, Coolio, the same thing. You know, these people who are in their like late 50s, early 60s, you know, about 15 to 20 years before the end of their life expectancy. Um, and you know, rich. I mean, they've probably gotten decent medical care, at least uh, for the last few decades. And they're having these, uh, you know, strokes and heart attacks and different things. Uh, Sizemore is like, I think, basically in a vegetative state at this point. Like he had a catastrophic stroke that the doctors think he can't recover from. And they're thinking about, um, you know, end of life uh, protocols. But this is, I, I would have to guess COVID because um, it's, very common. I just saw another thing about 44 year old uh, cycling, of course, we would call that uh, uh, biking, I guess, um, instructor who, uh, you know, 44 years old, in very good shape, and has COVID, recovers, in quotes, from COVID, and then has a strange sensation a couple months later, and then like several days after this strange sensation, as a widowmaker heart attack. Um, so, and, and it was due to a clot. So that's what COVID is doing. It's a clotting disease. It's a cardiovascular disease. Um, and yet the beat goes on. So actually, this is a decent uh, intro here to the, the brief thing that I wanted to do today about uh, COVID. So just a real quick biobot to start out. Where did my biobot go? All right, so here's where we're at with um, the wastewater. Now, what you can see, this is for the entire pandemic going back over three years. What you see there on the left, this is the wastewater monitoring. So this is not reliant on testing or you know anything that, because like, they're not recording tests anymore. So you have to just go directly to the wastewater and count the viral particles in the wastewater. That's gonna be the most accurate. And it's also swift. I mean, it, it, you don't have to wait weeks. Like hospitalizations and deaths, that's a lagging indicator. It takes a while for those situations to develop. Wastewater, on the other hand, you get infected, it multiplies in your body, boom, it shows up in the wastewater when you excrete it. So on the left side, that first peak, that's like April, 2020. Then the next peak, that is December, January, 2020, 2021. Then it recedes. And then the next peak is Delta. That is like September, October, November, 2021. Then that enormous peak is Omicron BA1, December, January, February, 2022, just about a year ago. Then it drops way down as it does after every winter uh, prior to that. That's the typical pattern. You get uh, a big seasonal winter spike and then it drops. Well, what happened this year, 2023? 
in March through April, we see a climb. This is BA2. And then it starts to plateau. That's BA4, BA5. Then there's a peak. That is, um, I think, August 1st, that first peak. So we get a massive peak, which is way higher than any of the previous peaks, and we get it in the summer. Then what happens? Does it drop? Yeah, it drops, but not all the way down. It basically drops to the level of what was previously considered a massive surge. Then it goes right back up again for the December-January surge, which is at the exact same level as the summer surge. Now it's falling again, but is it falling to zero? What should March typically look like if you're controlling the spread with masking and social distancing and online schooling and things like that? Well, it should drop down almost to zero. What happened this year? It's dropping down about to the same level that it dropped to previously. So we're now in a never-ending plateau of COVID. When people try to tell you COVID is over, it's complete bullshit. It's totally wrong. So this is from biobot, B-I-O-B-O-T dot I-O slash data. If you just go to biobot dot I-O, the data link is like real, you know, big right, right in the middle of the page. So this is from the week of February 20. So it's just about eight or nine days old. This is where we are. We're just in a sustained thing that previously these levels would have been considered a surge. And what's happening? Long COVID, immune depletion from the infection. It's exhausting and killing T cells. And it's causing brain damage, liver damage, lung damage, kidney damage, heart damage. And people are having, there's a greatly increased incidence of heart attacks and uh, similar catastrophic events. So about Biobot, here's a quick note. So Biobot is contracting um, with the US government. And I just wanted to read this. This is from a few weeks ago. A review of Biobot's successful partnership with the CDC on the National Wastewater Surveillance System. So wastewater is surveilled for all kinds of different stuff, chemicals, viruses, etc. And they're looking for COVID, thank God, because without this would be really flying blind because they're not counting tests anymore. You do a rapid test, it's not even very accurate, and then it goes in the trash. You can go to a website like Make My Test Count and report it, but practically most people are not going to do that. So the uh, case count is wildly, wildly inaccurate. It's basically meaningless at this point. Uh, what we need is regular standard weekly testing at all large institutional employers, colleges, high schools, etc. cetera, uh, PCR tests, real tests, and we need to be tracking that and doing contact tracing and all the things that you would do to stop the spread. Not going hands off at a time when there's more COVID circulating than ever before. Anyway. As part of their response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. Centers for Disease, I guess they still call them the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, we call them the U.S. Centers for Disease, launched the National Wastewater Surveillance System, NWSS, to track the presence and spread of COVID-19 and its variants across the country. NWSS was built upon a previous wastewater monitoring program that Biobot collaborated on with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, and CDC. And again, you know, just on the note of Centers for Disease, why do we call them that? Is it because we don't believe in public health or medicine? No, absolutely not. They don't. They don't believe in public health and medicine. They'll be out there telling you to cough into your sleeve for COVID. Anything, they'll be bending over backwards to tell you, uh, well, that, not that they tell you not to mask, but they will bend over backwards not to tell you to mask. They will uh, avoid any mention of masking at this point. It's wantonly irresponsible. But this is all in furtherance of corporate profits and pretending that everything's normal. Uh, when you're pretending that things are normal, when things are obviously falling apart around you, that is a desperate, maladaptive coping strategy. That's all that that is. It's denial. And it's, again, desperate. Um, it's not serving anyone but the people who profit from the illusion that things are okay. You know, keep spending money, don't let the terrorists win, et cetera, et cetera. That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with actual safety. Uh, nothing is safe right now. So not safe to go to school. It's not safe to go to work, et cetera, et cetera. 
but uh, they're continuing to propagate the, the lie that it is. Continuing, in April 2022, CDC selected Biobot Analytics to conduct wastewater analysis for NWSS and to enroll more locations across the country in that program. The partnership expanded to include monkeypox, which they're now calling MPOX, wastewater analysis in September 2022, and most recently the contract between the Biobot and the CDC was extended for an additional six months through the end of July 2023. So we will get these data for at least that long. Uh, and, you know, again, this is just what they're monitoring. There's more COVID out there. This is just what is being picked up at this point. Growing NWSS. Since April 2022, Biobot has enrolled more than 400 locations from over 250 counties across a total of 50 states and U.S. territories, providing coverage to more than 60 million people nationwide. Biobot tests each location for SARS coronavirus 2, monkeypox, and which they're calling MPXV at this point, uh, and conducts genomic sequencing to identify COVID-19 variants. To date, Biobot has processed 21,000 wastewater samples for NWSS. To achieve this, our team has worked quickly to onboard wastewater treatment facilities into the Biobot system, rapidly enrolling new participants in the program. So this is the number of samples being uh, loaded in for testing. Recently, NWSS has also been expanded to include testing for MPOX or monkeypox. You know, I, by the way, this is the first time hearing of that. I've seen that abbreviation before and realized it was, um, you know, no longer uh, being called that, but whatever. Utilizing the NWSS framework, MPOX monitoring was added in just a few short months, uh, sorry, added in just a few short months to existing wastewater sampling for all. Currently, boy, there's uh, two ambiguous points in that sentence for reading it to existing wastewater sampling for all currently enrolled facilities and will continue through the current contract extension, again July. It is crucial to have ongoing surveillance for highly infectious diseases such as MPOX. Continued wastewater monitoring can facilitate early detection, allowing for rapid response and mitigation should MPOX reemerge. Fortunately, how much of that rapid response is just going to be bullshitting? Biobot wastewater analysis has informed program participants, the public, and public health responses across the U.S. Throughout the process of working with the CDC, we've learned that it takes more than wastewater testing and analysis to run a successful wastewater monitoring program. In addition to processing samples for MPXV and SARS coronavirus 2 in our laboratory in Boston, Biobot supports the NWSS program and participating wastewater treatment facilities in many ways, from enrolling and onboarding new locations to answering questions and providing educational opportunities for participants to learn and connect with our in-house experts. Our Biobot team is made up of robust laboratory operations and R&D personnel, in addition to our customer support, sales, government affairs, data science, communications, epidemiology group, and more, all working together to ensure the success of the program. In this space, Biobot is paving the way for public and private sector partnerships to be an effective tool for achieving public health goals. Um, we're, not, we're not actually doing so great on that front. Uh, wastewater intelligence, a key to predicting our public health future. Throughout the pandemic, wastewater monitoring has been a reliable indicator of disease prevalence and has become even more important as other data sources, such as clinical cases, have become less comprehensive. That's certainly a polite way of saying it's just gone out the window and that's not like a politically neutral uh, event that they're just not testing people anymore. It's entirely in service of the desperate push for, quote, normality in the face of a situation which is anything but. Anyway, we see a future in which wastewater intelligence platforms such as NWSS continue monitoring for COVID uh, and MPOX, but also expand to other infectious diseases, emerging pathogens, and beyond. Investing in expanding the testing capacities of these wastewater monitoring systems will continue to help to inform proactive public health responses. Stay tuned for future Biobot product launches and wastewater platform expansions as we continue to grow our team and capabilities. So anyway, they're uh, in agreement uh, through July. Uh, this, you know, 
is going to continue. Basically, we'll keep having um, news about COVID in the wastewater. That is good because it's kind of all we have to go on at this point. Now, kind of to illustrate this point, let's turn to an article. This is a fairly short one. This is about a study. Where did my thing go? So this is from uh, Medical Life Sciences News by Dr. Chinta Siddharthan. Study shows COVID-19 rates were likely 40 times higher than CDC estimates during the BA4, BA5 dominant period in the US. So they were lying to you by a factor of 40 as far as how much COVID was actually going around. <clears throat> Let me get a sip here. All right. In a recent study published in Preventive Medicine, and this is just dated two days ago, February 27th, researchers evaluate the prevalence of severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS CoV 2 infections, and the incidence of long coronavirus disease or long COVID during the surge of the SARS coronavirus 2 Omicron subvariants BA4 and BA5 in the United States. So, again, um, going back to Biobot, this was the, let me bring it up here. This was the um, surge, not the most recent high peak, but the one before it. Because the most recent high peak, there was still um, some BA4, BA5 offshoots in there. But XBB was kind of the new emerging thing in that. They're talking about the second to last one. That's when BA4 and BA5 made their debut. Then after that, there were all the BA5 and BA4 and BA2 offshoots, like BQ1 and BQ11, along with XBB1.5. Um, the most recent thing was being driven largely by the BQs, which again comes off of BA5. So again, every few months, there's, there's a new thing at this point. But talking about this one back in July and August, the CDC was underestimating this by like a factor of 40. So yeah, don't believe the bullshit that they're putting out. Also, this is what happens when they tell you just like, you know, cough into your sleeve, wear a fucking respirator, you know, N95, P100, whatever, but it's got to be real, not surgical mask, not cloth, uh, wear an N95. Uh, so the background. Over two years after the onset of the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 pandemic, the emergence of SARS coronavirus 2 variants with novel mutations, which enabled the virus to evade the immune system, enabling immune evasion, combined with the waning of vaccine-induced immunity, because remember, you got two things going on there. <clears throat> Number one, the vaccines are good and helpful but they themselves alone cannot control spread. They reduce symptoms, which is good because you don't want to end up in the hospital. You don't want to die. Uh, they also reduce your odds of long COVID, but only to a point. So those are all good things. But what Biden said was vax and relax, vax or mask. In other words, if you had gotten the vaccine, <clears throat> you were no longer uh, required to mask. This was brazenly irresponsible. And that was 22 months ago in mid uh, May 2021. So we're, we've seen what happens when you run that policy. You get the emergence of new variant after new variant after new variant and a lot, a lot of cases which mostly aren't being counted. So how do we know that they're there? Because of the wastewater. It wouldn't be in the wastewater if people weren't getting infected with it. So that's on the one hand, these vaccines are good, but the coverage wanes. Not only is it not enough to control the spread on its own, um, it also fades with time. So it's not just a, you get the shot and you're good for life. You're covered for maybe a few months. And now maybe people are getting reinfected within a few weeks. So that leads into point number two, the virus has changed to evade our immune systems. So we're dealing with a virus now that's much different from the virus that we initially encountered in 2019, 2020. The new virus, which is as mutated away from SARS coronavirus 2, the original strain, as SARS coronavirus 2 was from SARS 1, we're now dealing with a hugely mutated thing. 
<clears throat> one of its new mutant abilities is it can evade your immune system much more effectively than the earlier strains could. So we got vaccines with waning protection and we got a virus which is mutating rapidly to escape all kinds of immunity. So anyway, because of this, continuing, persists the risk of COVID-19 associated morbidity, that would be sickness, and mortality, that would be death. Although early efforts to develop COVID-19 vaccines and a worldwide impetus to vaccinate the global population significantly reduced the severity of SARS coronavirus 2 infections and global mortality or death rates, the public health measures for COVID-19 surveillance have not kept up with the rate at which novel SARS coronavirus 2 variants are emerging. So really what the capitalists who run the world wanted was here, take this shot, then we'll get on with business as usual. But it didn't work like that. Like the virus just ran around the vaccines and uh, we needed to stop spreading it. You need the masks, you need the testing, you need all those measures. You can't just vax and relax. Yes, vax, it's gonna help uh, to you know reduce your odds of severe illness. But it, that's the beginning, not the end of the protection strategy. Okay, you know, get vaccinated, but that's in case of a mask failure. You need to have, you know, in N95, we trust. Everything else is plan B, C, D, and onward. All right. But they're not telling you that now. So that's why we call it the Centers for Disease. Because the main thing is we have to stop that spread. And they're just not even, not even not emphasizing it. They're not even saying it, really. So anyway, um, the decline in diagnostic screening rates and an increase in at-home testing using rapid antigen tests could underestimate the true infection rates, and indeed it has. Surveillance based on exposures and symptoms could also present a non-representative sample of the general population. Why? If you're just looking at symptoms, there's a lot of uh, asymptomatic cases. And as we know, even mild or even asymptomatic COVID can result in brain shrinkage and aging of your brain equivalent to 10 years uh, worth of aging. Really, really bad stuff. So surveillance measures also need to evolve to accommodate the long-lasting effects of severe COVID-19. Therefore, as the pandemic evolves, not ends, just changes, population-based surveys are essential for providing true estimates of infection rates and incidences of long COVID. Incidences are new cases. Um, so about the study, in the present study, the researchers conducted a bilingual and cross-sectional survey among U.S. adults above the age of 18 through mobile phones and landlines for four days starting July 30, 2022. An iterative weighting method was used to ensure that selective participants represented the races, ethnicities, age groups, genders, and education levels of the general population. The questionnaire determined the results from rapid antigen at-home test kits and polymerase chain reaction or PCR tests in the two weeks leading up to the survey, which was when Omicron BA4, BA5 subvariants were the dominant, dominant circulating strains of SARS coronavirus 2, so last summer. The survey also gathered data on COVID-19 symptoms and close contacts that had probable or confirmed SARS coronavirus 2 infections. The queried list of symptoms included fever, fever nasal congestion or runny nose, cough, fatigue, dyspnea, that's difficulty breathing, headaches, body aches, anosmia, that is lack of smell, uh, agoisia, that's actually, uh, I'm not familiar with that one, nausea, diarrhea, and sore throat. What is agoisia? Vocab fail, coming right back. See, this is key. And I said this at the very first video I did. When you read, keep a dictionary handy. Loss of sense of taste, okay. Oh, okay, like gustatory. All right, fair enough. Loss of sense of taste. Uh, and why is that, by the way? Why do you lose your sense of smell or why do some people lose their sense of smell with COVID? Because it is damaging the neurons in the front part of your brain near your nose, that's why. Okay, information on comorbidities, that would be co-occurring sicknesses and vaccination status was also obtained. To this end, participants were categorized as vulnerable if they were unvaccinated or reported one or more comorbidities. And by the way, let's just take a moment to remember over 80% of people in the U.S. 
are overweight or obese by BMI. And uh, that, so that would be 80% of people have at least one comorbidity, and many people have uh, <clears throat> more than one. The point prevalence of COVID-19 was estimated for confirmed, probable, and possible cases based on self-reported positive test results and close contact with confirmed cases. So th there are a few issues with this study here. Um, you're relying on data being reported by the people that you're interviewing and, and so forth. So that understood, continuing. <clears throat> Furthermore, four immunity categories were created based on vaccination status and previous SARS coronavirus 2 infections, ranging from individuals who had no immunity to individuals who had hybrid immunity from vaccinations and previous SARS coronavirus 2 infections. Just a side note on the previous infections thing, one of the problems about the human immune system is we experience something called immune imprinting, which is the immune system will imprint on or make a very strong impression off of the first um, variant of a particular pathogen that you encounter. And from this very strong impression, your immune system will have a lasting response to anything that even looks similar. Uh, I mean, we can be this way with individuals sometimes psychologically, but your immune system is like this as well. It encounters one pathogen and then it treats all similar pathogens uh, or pathogens that appear to be similar to it um, in the same way. So what we're seeing with COVID is people who got infected with an early version, you know, an early variant. Um, they're then getting infected with a much more recent strain, but their body is creating antibodies that would have been great against the first strain, but don't work against the new strain. So this is the immune imprinting, and it continues to be a problem with COVID. <clears throat> and um, different variants react in different ways, and they cause different amounts of imprinting, and or different <clears throat> imprinting behavior. And um, this is yet another reason why just Vax and Relax was a terrible, terrible idea. <clears throat> the fallout of which is still ongoing. Anyway, the point prevalence of long COVID was also estimated based on participants who had previous SARS coronavirus 2 infections and confirmed symptoms such as fatigue, difficulty breathing, and difficulty concentrating that persisted for more than four weeks after recovering from COVID-19. <clears throat> So again, incidence is new cases, prevalence is number of cases at a given time. So they're talking about point prevalence, prevalence at that point. Study findings, about 17% of study participants reported being infected with SARS coronavirus 2 during the Omicron BA4, BA5 dominant period. This equates to 44 million cases, which is much higher than the 1.8 million cases estimated by the US Centers for Disease during that period. When the prevalence of SARS coronavirus 2 infections was analyzed, according to sociodemographic factors, adults between the ages of 18 and 24 had a higher incidence of infections, as did non-Hispanic, <clears throat> excuse me, non-Hispanic black and Hispanic adults. The prevalence of infections also varied according to income and education levels, with groups with lower income and lower education having a higher incidence of SARS coronavirus 2 infections. So this is typical. We have done several articles about COVID's unequal distribution across racial and ethnic and class lines. And so that is typical. Throwing in the age one there. So you've got people who are 18 and 24 getting a higher incidence of infections. So think of college age people being in dormitories. Um, think of just people working and, you know, I mean, people much uh, sympathy and compassion for people who are between the ages of 18 and 24, but it's a rough time. You're out there in the adult world at a real disadvantage. Um, I remember being between 18 and 24, and I didn't know anything, and I felt confused and bewildered by a lot of the world around me, uh, and I didn't have to do it during a pandemic. So anyway, a lot of compassion for those people, but they're getting infected at a higher rate as well. That's something we haven't talked about before. Continuing, approximately 21.5% of the patients who had SARS coronavirus 2 infections four weeks before the survey reported experiencing long COVID symptoms. So this is again, typical, you know, you would expect to see 15 to 20, something like that, 
um, percent of people continuing to have those lasting infections. It's things like fatigue, muscle aches, headache, uh, brain fog or cognitive impairment that would be indicative of brain damage. Um, all kinds of other things, uh, breathing difficulties, sleep difficulties, emotional disturbances, and so on. So about 21.5% of people uh, reported those kinds of symptoms uh, uh, four weeks or later after the infection. This estimate was higher than the 18.9 estimate for long COVID incidents reported by the Household Pulse survey. It is higher, not by much, it's by, by a few percentage points. And again, you know, when in doubt, say 15 to 20 percent, you're going to be, I think, pretty safe saying that. Moreover, in contrast to previous studies, the prevalence of long COVID among older individuals was found to be lower than that among younger individuals. This may be attributed to the current study not being restricted to individuals who had accessed medical care or were hospitalized. Now, we know that Hospitalization dramatically ramps up your odds of getting long COVID. Your odds go from 15, 20% up to like 50, 60% if you get hospitalized. If your infection is bad enough for you to be hospitalized, you are several times more likely to get long COVID. In fact, you're more likely than not to get long COVID and, and have those symptoms going on for weeks and months after the infection. Uh, I would also ask uh, the prevalence of long COVID uh, being lower in older people. Is it because they died? So wondering there. Or again, is it because they took uh, Paxlovid, which seems to only work in older people? Um, so yeah, conclusions. The prevalence of SARS coronavirus 2 infections and the incidence of long COVID among adults above the age of 18 in the U.S. was found to be higher than previous estimates that were primarily focused on hospitalized patients and those seeking medical care. So in other words, this study didn't just go off of medical records. They called people up, said, hey, have you had COVID, etc. Notably, the prevalence of SARS coronavirus 2 infections varied based on sociodemographic Sociodemographic factors such as race, age, income, and education levels. This inequity in infection prevalence during the surge of Omicron BA4, BA5 will likely result in an inequitable incidence of long COVID in the future. There's a journal reference there. The study was called The Prevalence of SARS Coronavirus 2 Infection and Long COVID in U.S. Adults During the BA4, BA5 Surge, June to July 2022, by Cosmia S.A. Robertson, M.M., Teasdale, C.A., et al., published in Preventive Medicine. All right, so that's on the screen. So that's our COVID stuff for today. I have many more COVID articles we're going to do in a separate COVID update, which we do about every other month or so. Uh, it's a lot, but COVID is not over, not by a long shot. Anyway, I hope that is helpful, John. S4A has the best quality commentary on the left. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate the support. I'm trying to do uh, quality work, and uh, I only wish, uh, you know, I get some goofy-ass comments. Um, you know I did the reading. You know I did the reading because I fucking posted it. And just people, I don't know, tend to freak out when they hear things that they don't want to hear. Got to get over that. Really got to get over that. As communists, we cannot be so ego-bound. You know, this has got to be about the science. Hang on a second. All right, had some uh, disturbance going on in the background. Continuing. Uh, probably higher considering the new strain. I imagine 100 million people have long COVID in the U.S. right now. That's why everyone is so stupid here. I mean, people are really struggling, and it is the result of, uh, at least in part, brain damage caused by COVID-19. It's scary. I mean, it's not a, you know, it's not a thing that we take lightly at all. People are getting brain damage from COVID-19. That's what it does. And it's not, you know, improving anyone's ability to deal with, the, to cope with the situation or to figure it out. It's really bad. And yeah, I mean, with the XBB, so the new dominant thing that's coming in, the XBB 0.1.5, 
Uh, the X means that it is a recombinant or crossbreed strain. What happens is people will get infected with more than one strain of the virus at a time. And within that person's body, the virus swaps genetic material. It recombines its genetic material and you wind up with mutations coming off of that. Now, there's also a drug which is being given, which insanely enough, um, is intended to kill COVID by mutating it into oblivion. The problem is that 1% of uh, the virus that doesn't get entirely mutated uh, to death, but gets mutated enough that you've just enhanced its genetic uh, resiliency, its genetic variation to a point which actually can be advantageous to the virus and help it adapt for increased fitness and we're going to do articles on that in the next uh, COVID update. Yay, this is the first time I've been able to catch the stream live, was watching on YouTube, and could never figure out why I couldn't catch it live until recently. Never used Twitch before, so hello. Well, welcome. And yeah, we do have it set that um, your Twitch account has to be older than a week or whatever. We take a number of anti-troll measures, so anyway, welcome. Let's rip on libertarians a bit. I need to take a break from ripping on libertarians a bit. Just a, a little bit, fine. I have to work with them all day and they can't help but to constantly rant about trans people. Yeah, I knew somebody who did this too. Um, and I just said, I was like, what do I care if somebody wants to be trans? Like, how does that uh, hurt or even affect me in like any way? They didn't have an answer. This is somebody who was like, making anti-trans like memes and all this stuff and i'm like you can't even tell me how this even affects you let alone hurts you and you're like devoting your life to a hate campaign so yeah meanwhile in my state they just banned drag shows meanwhile one out of four kids live below the poverty line it's what it's all about anything to scapegoat and distract anything I work in a distribution center surrounded by libertarians and Republicans. I know the feeling. Yeah. I work in food service. I get a pretty wide variety of political opinions, but definitely lots of potential for radicalization in low-wage jobs like this. And so, yeah, something like that, food service is historically not a unionized sector. We're starting to see more of it. I mean, there's, you know, large unions like UCFW, um, that do some food service unionizing. They're not a great union. They're probably better than nothing. Um, but yeah, we need a massively increased uh, dose of militancy uh, throughout. Oh yeah, so we had the um, comment here, Italy banning welfare is fucking insane. Let's uh, take a moment to go into that too, actually. And I think I have to move. Yeah, I just got to copy this into the folder so I can access it. This is a short story. There we go. Let's get into that. Oops. So this is um, off of a Politsturm article. Politsturm is a Marxist-Leninist outlet. Uh, all the work I've seen from them is good. If people are looking for additional uh, Marxist-Leninist resources, they are... Um, primarily based out of Russia. They have, uh, according to their international tab that you can see at the top, outlets in Russia, Ukraine, and I think Armenia. There's also a U.S. branch of it. The U.S. branch has a YouTube channel where they do videos, and I think they're doing good content. And um, they also have a Russian language YouTube channel, which has like 50,000 subscribers. Uh, if people are looking for, you know, other stuff to get into and read, I would recommend checking out Politsturm, P-O-L-I-T-S-T-U-R-M. All right, so this is a piece uh, there. Italy's far-right government declares the abolition of welfare by 2024. So remembering, uh, and we did a video showing Jackson Hinkle and Jimmy Dore running some PR for Georgia Maloney. Um, led by, is leading the um, Italian government. Georgia Maloney is about 45 years old and since age 15, in other words, A, for 30 years and B, her entire adult life has been involved in far-right and fascist 
uh, political parties. She that's been her literally entire life since age 15 has been in the fascist uh, politics of Italy. She now runs the Italian government. They were, of course, doing things. How is that fascist? She's a populist. She's fucking fascist, dude. So are most of the things that you're calling populist. And, you know, wakey, wakey. I know that uh, that click money and the super chat money, it feels super comfortable in your pocket, but you're literally selling fascism to people. Okay. So, uh, reading the article, the new Italian government led by far-right party FDIs, uh, that's the Fratelli, it's like the Brothers of Italy, Fratelli d'Italia, Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney stated that they intend to completely abolish citizens' income in 2024. Citizens' income is a regular welfare payment from the state to citizens or permanent residents who belong to certain groups, unemployed, disabled, pensioners, etc., so how is that fascist? Well, here you go, dude. They're coming. It's on the chopping block. Significant changes to unemployment and disability benefits will come into effect in January 2023. Uh, they mean 2024? Anyway. No, that's correct. Okay, I guess this is like uh, from a couple of months ago. Um, in this year-long transition period, citizens and permanent residents of Italy who are considered able-bodied by the Italian government will receive unemployment benefits for a maximum of eight months. Moreover, these people will have to complete some form of professional training or retraining for at least six months. Otherwise, they will lose further payments from the state. If an unemployed person turns down the first job offer deemed appropriate, they will also lose their right to claim benefits. So it sounds like they're making this a lot more like the U.S. unemployment system, which is fucking terrible. Anyone who has used it can tell you. Uh, I mean, a lot of people just used it during COVID. Um, it's it's not a good system. Like, anytime you have a question, you try to call, the fucking phone number's disconnected. Like, it's not a good system. Anyway, currently, on average, unemployment benefits for one person are 500 euros per month. According to the Italian Institute of Social Security, INPS, in September 2022, 2.4 million citizens and permanent residents of Italy received this citizen's income. Like the, uh, unlike the unemployment benefit, disability benefit will be paid as usual through 2023, but by 2024, it'll be canceled. So no more disability benefits. A new system of subsidies will be introduced instead of a citizen's income for all disabled people. The system apparently will provide state assistance only to poor people. The exact, I guess everyone else is just supposed to invest. I don't know. The exact criteria used to determine who will be included in this category is not public knowledge yet. And then finishing out the article... Cutting these benefits is expected to save the Italian government more than 700 million euros in 2023. The savings from the complete elimination of citizens' income in 2024 will amount to billions of euros. The abolition of a citizen's income for the unemployed and disabled in Italy clearly demonstrates that bourgeois states represent interests fundamentally opposed to the interests of ordinary workers. Not only in Italy, but in all capitalist countries, the ruling elite is permanently searching for new ways to explicitly or implicitly, quote, optimize their help to those in need. In reality, to increase their profits. While much spectacle is made of the repressive and militaristic aspects of fascization, be the process of becoming fascist. The immiseration of workers carries out the most important task to feed the capitalists who are at the true center of reactionary reform. That's an important thing. So they're saying while much spectacle is made of the repressive and militaristic, militaristic aspects of a country going fascist, this process of immiserating workers, cutting benefits, etc., that's actually the heart of it. And we're so far along into that process in the United States. For this reason, the working class cannot count on the mercy and compassion of the bourgeoisie to ensure its basic needs. Realizing its class interests, the working class must make every effort to establish socialism. Only under socialism, everyone, where the right to work is recognized, uh, oh, sorry, um, I think should be everywhere. Only under socialism everywhere, where the right to work is recognized, will people be able to work in accordance with their abilities and will receive the basic necessities for life, which is lacking in a lot of places. People don't get even the basic necessities. Everything is commodified. We need to decommodify 
stop treating as commodities a lot of basic essentials and just you know produce them to be used for people not for profit so um, I looked at some of the resources uh, two are in English from Reuters and so this is just reading from one of them the title of the article is fact box <clears throat> and this is uh, from November 22nd um, Italy's government approves 2023 budget key points um, and this is libertarian stuff too because they say tax cuts for employees around 4.2 billion euros go to reducing the tax wedge the difference between the salary an employer pays and what a worker takes home with the benefit going to low income workers the f um, so this is like something that libertarians are constantly saying like oh well if we cut you know income tax then you'd have less money taken out of your paycheck yeah and, and where does that money go exactly oh it goes to you know uh, things you're going to need later in life and they're like oh yeah well just invest in the stock market okay so you're still going to have me take that money out of my paycheck just not have the government do it and instead of putting it into a government trust fund you're gonna have me risk it on the stock market where there's no guarantee of anything so no actually there's still money coming out of my paycheck you're just telling me I have to take it out myself and put it into the stock market rather than something guaranteed by the government right so um, anyway I'm just gonna leave it there but uh, good article as usual let's uh, back to the screen and continue with the chat was the war on terror a natural progression natural progression for US imperialism uh, yes yes so that was uh, pretty much the era when I became politically conscious you know people often uh, start becoming developing more of a social con consciousness in their 20s or so i mean it'll the seeds of it begin before that but that's really kind of uh, when you get out into the world and start really thinking about things um for me it was during that era and watching bush and cheney uh roll out the war on terror which i cannot stress to you if you don't really remember the world before that how shockingly night and day different it became um after that the level of uh jingoism uh, just on literally everywhere you turned um the the hyper patriotism etc uh in you know the terrorists are behind every bush and mailbox uh out to get your freedoms they hate us for our freedoms etc etc so why did they do this well um we've discussed this before the people who wound up in the bush cheney government a lot of them came from a think tank the uh, project for the new American century. I mean, they were also recycled from the Reagan government and the Bush one government. Remember that uh, Bush's father, W's father, Bush senior, was Reagan's vice president throughout the 80s, and then he was president um, from you know 89 to 93. So yeah, um, you know, all these people just got recycled. You know, then Clinton was in for eight years, and then this. Uh, you know these uh, right-wingers came back but they were writing in the late 90s in their policy papers hey we need to um they did a paper rebuilding america's defenses and they're writing in there about militarizing space and remember trump with space force okay that was being discussed during the bush cheney years there's a lot of continuity to all of this stuff and they were like okay here's the thing so we need to you know um have our weapons companies make all this shit but the american people absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event they're not going to go for this uh we need a new pearl harbor and of course we had 9 11. so um conveniently uh the u.s government got the pretext that they needed to um ramp up their military efforts and go after all these countries that they have been wanting to target but which, up until the early 90s, the Soviet Union had been standing in the way of, and to a somewhat lesser extent, China also standing in the way of. Um, so it was like with the USSR gone, throughout the 90s, uh, the US imperialists and their allies were just like licking their lips. How do we just get in there? And 
the war on terror was a structured framework for getting into Central Asia, you know, places that they never would have been able to get into before, and the Middle East, and etc. And of course, they had been making various forays into this with the first Gulf War uh, back under Bush one, and and so on. So it is a nat natural progression. Yeah, absolutely. It was well planned, and uh, absolutely served all the strategic interests of U.S. imperialism. Um, getting their hands on more oil, geopolitical control, setting up more and more bases throughout the Middle East and Central Asia. I mean, the goal is world domination. So yeah, for sure. Anyway, yeah. Happy to answer additional questions if you want to follow up on that. But as a general thing, yeah, totally. It wasn't some, uh, I mean, did the war on terror end? No, it's still, they don't talk about terrorism as much as they did in the 2000s when it was mentioned at least like 49 times an hour on TV but um, it never really ended they'll bring it back as soon as they need to bring it back they just don't need to bring it back right now did you see that Norfolk Southern this is the company behind that Ohio uh, bomb train has their own private police force as three special ops groups I found this out today from a documentary um, I didn't know specifically about their own private police force. I had seen that journalists have been arrested at press um, uh, press conferences. Like I'm pretty sure that's where journalists are supposed to be, is at a press conference. They're getting arrested. There's various people. Um, we read a story, I think, on here about somebody just walking up to a creek and looking at it and being like accosted by a group so yeah, they've definitely got teams out there. Um, you know what, actually, that, that's a decent uh, foray into the article we have about the uh, chemical accidents. Why don't we just go ahead and read that? So obviously the bomb train in Ohio, you know, deservedly got a lot of press. There's a major, major disaster. People have been comparing it to Chernobyl. Chernobyl was relatively well contained compared to that. And not nearly as many people died from that. It's not possible to know the true number of dead, but it's probably a lot lower than what we're going to see here. Uh, this is probably more comparable to Bhopal. Anyway, this is a Guardian article by Carrie Gilliam, or Gillum, from February 25th, a few days ago, revealed the U.S. is averaging one chemical accident every two days. Oh, I had it backwards. I said two accidents every one day. One accident every two days. Guardian analysis in light of, uh, Guardian analysis of data in light of Ohio train derailment shows accidental releases are happening consistently. I would change that. Yeah, it's like basically constantly uh, every other day. And there's a picture, an EPA emergency response member agitates water to check for chemicals, which may have settled at the bottom of a creek uh, after a train derailment in Ohio. Let's continue. Mike DeWine, the Ohio governor, recently lamented the, lamented the toll taken on the residents of East Palestine after the toxic train derailment there, saying, quote, no other community should have to go through this. But... Such accidents are happening with striking regularity. A Guardian analysis of data collected by the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, and by nonprofit groups that track chemical accidents in the U.S., shows that accidental releases, be they through train derailments, truck crashes, pipeline ruptures, or industrial plant leaks and spills, are happening consistently across the country. By one estimate, these in incidents are occurring on average every two days. Quote, these kinds of hidden disasters happen far too frequently. Matthew Stanislaus, who served as assistant administrator of the EPA's Office of Land and Emergency Management during the Obama administration, told The Guardian, Stanislaus led programs focused on the cleanup of contaminated hazardous waste sites, chemical plant safety, oil spill prevention, and emergency response. Quote, uh, oh, same paragraph. In the first seven weeks of 2023 alone, there were more than 30 incidents recorded by the Coalition to Prevent Chemical Disasters. I think this is right up their alley. Roughly one every day and a half. Okay. Last year, the Coalition recorded 188, up from 177 in 2021. The group has tallied more than 470 incidents since it started counting in April 2020. 
the incidents logged by the coalition range widely in severity. So some are super severe, others not so much. But each does involve the accidental release of chemicals deemed to pose potential threats to human and environmental health. And you can see a map up there on the uh, on the screen. Uh, it's titled Map of Reported Chemical Accidents in the U.S. Created by Coalition to Prevent Chemical Disasters. The red icons, which is by far the uh, predominant color on the map, indicate accidents from 1 January to uh, 31 December 2022, so during the year of uh, 2022. The purple icons indicate since January 2023. There's still a lot of those. In September, for instance, nine people were hospitalized and 300 evacuated in California after a spill of caustic materials at a recycling facility. In October, officials ordered residents to shelter in place after an explosion and fire at a petrochemical plant in Louisiana. In November, more than 100 residents of Atchison, Kansas, were treated for respiratory problems and schools were evacuated after an accident at a beverage manufacturing facility created a chemical cloud over the town. And there are links to all of these. Did you hear about any of these? I sure didn't. Among multiple incidents in December, a large pipeline ruptured in rural northern Kansas, smothering the surrounding land and waterways in 588,000 gallons of diluted bitumen crude oil. Hundreds of workers are still trying to clean up the pipeline mess at a cost pegged at around $488 million. The precise number of hazardous chemical incidents is hard to determine because the U.S. has multiple agencies involved in response. So in other words, they're spread over multiple agencies. You've got to round them all up, and some are hiding in this agency, and some are hiding over here. But the EPA told The Guardian that over the past 10 years, the agency has, quote, performed an average of 235 emergency response actions per year, including responses to discharges of hazardous chemicals or oil. The agency said, and by the way, if you're not aware, oil, massively, <clears throat> massively toxic. There is a whole litany of terrible shit in oil uh, when it comes to direct exposure to the human body, or non-human bodies for that matter. The agency said that it employs roughly 250 people devoted to the EPA's emergency response and removal program. Live in daily fear of an accident. The coalition has counted 10 rail-related chemical contamination events over the last two and a half years, including the derailment in East Palestine, where dozens of cars on a Norfolk Southern train derailed on the 3rd of February, contaminating the community of 4,700 people with toxic vinyl chloride. The vast majority of incidents, however, occur at the thousands of facilities around the country where dangerous chemicals are used and stored. Quote, what happened in East Palestine, this is a regular occurrence for communities living adjacent to chemical plants, said Stanislaus. They live in daily fear of an accident. In all, roughly 200 million people are at regular risk, with many of them people of color or otherwise disadvantaged communities, they said. So this is environmental racism, where you make the, uh, you know, you put the plant next to the black neighborhood. Why is there a black neighborhood in the first place? Ghettoization, bad race relations, racism, systemic prejudice, discrimination, uh, the United States is a fascist hellhole, but um, it's not just, you know, facing the microaggressions and day-to-day -day experiences. It's also, um, you know, what are the consequences of racism in the U.S.? You're far more likely. doesn't mean that if you're not a person of color, you will not be exposed to anything, guaranteed. It means you're more likely to get all the bad shit that the USA has to offer, including the hazmat incidents. Continuing. Um... There are close to 12,000 facilities across the nation that have on site, quote, extremely hazardous chemicals and amounts that could harm people, the environment, or property if accidentally released, according to a Government Accountability Office, or GAO, report issued last year. These facilities include petroleum refineries, chemical manufacturers, cold storage facilities, fertilizer plants, and water and wastewater treatment plants, among others. EPA data shows more than 1,650 accidents at these facilities in a 10-year span between 2004 and 2013, roughly 160 a year. So that's a roughly consistent with what we were just saying. Uh, more than 775, uh, 775 
were reported from 2014 through 2020. Additionally, after analyzing accidents in a recent five-year period, the EPA said it found accident response evacuations impacted more than 56,000 people, and 47,000 people were ordered to shelter in place. So you got about 100,000 people uh, with that level of impact. Accident rates are particularly high for petroleum and coal manufacturing and chemical manufacturing facilities, according to the EPA. The most accidents were logged in Texas, of course, followed by Louisiana and California. Now, Texas is one of the biggest states. Of course, there's also a lot of oil fields, and it's also fucking Texas. The 10 states with the most accidents from 2004 to 2020 is the chart here. Number of accidents at facilities handling hazardous chemicals tracked by the EPA. Texas, Louisiana, California, Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, Arkansas, Florida, Kansas, Pennsylvania. Though, in, and of course, Texas and Louisiana are leading by a lot. So Texas is at like 380, whereas number four, Illinois, is like just over 100. Though industry representatives say that the rate of accidents is trending down, um, I mean, not really. <laughs> I mean, if there's an average of 160, and then last year we had 188, that would be slightly up, not slightly down. At best, it's sort of holding level. But worker and community advocates disagree. They say that incomplete data and delays in reporting incidents give a false sense of improvement. <clears throat> the EPA itself says that by several measurements, accidents at facilities are becoming worse. Evacuations, sheltering, and the average annual rate of people seeking medical treatment stemming from these chemical accidents are on the rise. Total annual costs are approximately $477 million, including costs related to injuries and deaths. Accidental releases remain a significant concern, the EPA is quoted as saying. In August, the EPA proposed changes to the Risk Management Program Regulations, RMP, that apply to plants dealing with hazardous chemicals. The rule changes reflect the recognition by EPA that many chemical facilities are located in areas that are vulnerable to the impacts of the climate crisis, including power outages, flooding, hurricanes, and other weather events. They're just noting that now. The proposed changes include enhanced emergency preparedness, increased public access to information about hazardous chemicals risks communities face, and new accident prevention requirements. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, of course, lead it, leave it to the good old Chamber of Commerce, has pushed back on stronger regulations. They won't be happy until there are none, arguing that most facilities operate safely. Yeah, you only need a few to not operate safely, though. Accidents are declining, again, no, and the facilities impacted by any rule changes are supplying, quote, here we go, essential products and services that help drive our economy and provide jobs in our communities. I mean, they might as well just say national security because this is the carte blanche that's used to do any heinous shit that you can possibly think of. National security, oh, it's essential products, jobs, we're, we're, we're job creators, let us pollute. Let us threaten people's lives. We need to. Of course, it has nothing to do with profit, right? Nothing. No, that doesn't even factor in. They're just such fucking patriots, these people. Other opponents to strengthening safety rules include the American Chemistry Council, American Forest and Paper Association, American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, and the American Petroleum Institute, shockingly, is against uh, other regulations. There's a scene from the bomb train. The changes are, quote, unnecessary and will not improve safety, according to the American Chemistry Council. Okay. W what will improve safety then? I'm sure just, you know, putting more faith and trust in, in these companies, according to them. Many worker and community advocates, such as the International Union, United Automobile, Aerospace, and, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America, UAW, um, the reason we just say UAW usually, which represents roughly a million laborers, say that the proposed rule changes don't go far enough, far from being unnecessary, they don't do enough. And Senator Cory Booker and U.S. Representative Nanette Barrigan, along with 47 other members of Congress, have also called on the EPA to strengthen regulations to protect communities from hazardous chemical accidents. 
quote, the East Palestine train derailment is an environmental disaster that requires full accountability and urgency from the federal government. We need that same urgency to focus on the prevention of these chemical disasters from occurring in the first place, Barrigan said in a statement issued to The Guardian. We're going to be ready. For Ebony Cochran, a mother and volunteer community activist, the East Palestine disaster has hardly added to her faith in the federal government. Cochran lives with her husband and 16-year-old son roughly 400 miles south of the derailment, near a Louisville, Kentucky industrial zone along the Ohio River that locals call Rubber Town. The area is home to a cluster of chemical manufacturing facilities, and curious odors and concerns about toxic exposures permeate the neighborhoods near the plants. Cochran and her family keep what she calls get-out-of-dodge backpacks, or bug-out kits, in the ready in case of a chemical accident. They stock the packs with two changes of clothes, protective eyewear, first aid kits, and other items that they think they may need if forced to flee their home. There's another picture of the East Palestine cleanup. The organization that she works with, Rubber Town Emergency Action, or REACT, wants to see continuous air monitoring near the plants, regular evacuation drills, and other measures to better prepare people in the event of an accidental chemical release, because it's probably just a matter of time. But it's been difficult to get the voices of locals heard, she says. Quote, decision makers are not bringing the impacted communities to the table, she said. In the meantime, REACT is trying to empower locals to be prepared to protect themselves if the worst happens. Providing emergency evacuation backpacks to people near plants is one small step. Quote, even in small doses, certain toxic chemicals can be dangerous. They can lead to long-term chronic illness. They can lead to acute illness, Cochran said. If there's a big explosion, we are going to be ready. Uh, that was uh, co-published with The New Lead, a journalism project of the Environmental Working Group. So uh, there is that article. Let's go back into the chat. I mean, this is, uh, you know, that's every other day there's like some kind of chemical incident. It's kind of a major issue. There's a communist streamer that always reads that anti-war libertarian website. Do you mean antiwar.com? That is indeed a conservative um, reactionary site, yes. I don't know how to feel about that because I personally wouldn't consume right-wing content. Maybe I'm just being too picky. Um, you can skim it for facts, like they might be linking to an interesting story, but do not swallow a single piece of their analysis. It's basically bullshit. We go over this a lot um, because I've been seeing it in the anti-war movement uh, you know, I marched back in 2003 on the global day of protest against the invasion of Iraq. And so, you know, this is like 20 years for me of sort of watching the anti-war movement. And I'm sure there's others who have been doing it for longer. But the point is, I didn't start doing this yesterday. And you can see libertarians who I really wasn't familiar with. It took me a while to sort of wrap my head around like libertarians is really not a joke and there's really no silver lining to it. They're really just advocate, advocating for dystopia, basically. Um, but this whole idea that you can have like some kind of anti-war capitalism. Well, you can't. Capitalism became imperialism long ago, and it's not going back because as Marxists, we understand the trajectory of historical development going forwards, not backwards. Uh, you can turn it backwards for a time at great cost, but it doesn't stay that way. Capital tends to consolidate over time etc. As for libertarians being anti-cop, who's going to enforce your private property? There's going to be the first people, you know, screaming about the shoplifting uh, crisis or whatever other uh, bullshit that the capitalists are coming up with. Um, so you, you can't trust them for shit. It's all a con. They're trying to co-opt the left. That's the whole point. We've uh, shared a number of times a 1986 interview with Lyndon LaRouche, where he's asked in that interview, um, you started out on the left, but now you're right wing. Like, what's the deal? And LaRouche's answer, and this guy is a big inspiration to the Pat Sox and Nazballs and whatever else people are calling them now. Um, LaRouche, it's all over. People like Jackson Henkel, stuff like that. They're all connected to LaRouche and the Schiller Institute. Well, LaRouche said, he's like, well, the, the left wing thing, first of all, was overstated. Um what we did was we entered SDS, a new left organization back in the 60s, 
basically to uh, try to combat the quote left problem f on its own turf. So they, to the extent that they come over to left positions at all, it's really to just combat us and to lead people away from the left. So anyway, we, we talked about that a lot in the last two streams, so I'll just direct people to that. We were talking about the Rage Against the War Machine rally, which was uh, hosted by the Libertarian Party. These people, they call themselves paleocons for a reason. They want to go back to this super old school type of conservatism. Um, you know, they say they're anti-imperialist. No, they're just pre-imperialist in the sense of they want to go back to you know, the earlier um, capitalism before it became imperialism because they themselves are reactionary petty bourgeoisie who are resentful that they didn't get rich enough and maybe they've been ruined by big capitalists, but they just don't understand the nature of capitalism. They think it's just going to hang out forever at this sort of low stage of development and consolidation. So that's that's basically the misunderstanding that libertarians... Uh, I mean, libertarians have many, many misunderstandings, but that's one of them. But yeah, no, don't believe the anti-war bullshit. It's it's total idealism on top of a system they're trying to sell you, which requires war. Is anyone else going to the D.C. rally on the 18th? So there is a large left-wing anti-war uh, rally being held this month in about three weeks, a little under three weeks, March 18. There's going to be the main event uh, by the White House in Washington, D.C., but there's also going to be various local events. Check with your local left groups to find out what is going on in your area, and if there isn't something going on, maybe organize something. Um, it's being led by the Answer Coalition, and we discussed in the last video some of the issues with that. For example, it's being headed by Brian Becker, um, who is sort of notorious campist, and um, you know the. Well, we got into some discussion about uh, well because they had the peace in Ukraine uh, rally, so we we're talking about how the the messaging around that is somewhat convoluted. Um, and, you know, what is a better slogan? Uh, no war but class war would be the, I would say, just the simple preferred established slogan for that. Um, opportunists call that simplistic, but then again, they will do anything to take the focus off of our main task, which is organizing for social revolution. They'll tell you that social revolution is impossible. Okay, in that case, you're not a socialist, congrats, you like sort of the idea of socialism, but you're not actually organizing towards it. Uh, it is possible. Uh, capitalism is putting up a fight, but there, I mean, look at how desperate. Um, you know, I noted this with, with the, the Tea Party after 2008, global financial meltdown, first major, major crisis of capitalism in a long time, because they had completely deregulated the financial sector uh, as part of, you know, the neoliberal push, and it really caught up with them. So now we're back to shaky, on-the-rails um, capitalism, where kind of anything goes, uh, rather than the comparatively more stable, better regulated capitalism. Well, as soon as it was politically convenient for them to take down those regulations, which this happened, uh, one of the major ones was revoking Glass-Steagall uh, in 1999 under Bill Clinton, Tim Geithner was his Treasury Secretary uh, out of Goldman Sachs, um, helped to write that piece of deregulation, and then boom, eight, nine years later, you get a uh, worldwide implosion. So after that major crisis, they've had to keep rolling out more and more um, reactionary stuff to confuse workers and to take them off the scent of capitalism or if you, they can't get them off of capitalism to give the, the wrong idea about socialism, etc., look at how hard they have to work. Uh, their news outlets have to go 24-7, spending billions of dollars uh, pumping out all of this misinformation and commercials for capitalism, ruling class ideology. Even within the underground, they put out people like the Pat Sox, the Caleb Maupins, neo-fascists, you know, uh, masquerading as Marxists. The reason they have to work this hard is because we are getting stronger and we will keep getting stronger. Then we'll win. But anyway, um, the thing about Answer and Brian Becker, it's, uh, 
you know, this is, while that is a left rally as compared to the Rage Against the War Machine rally, which was just libertarians and other types of far right, you know, extreme right people, um, the coalition behind that is, is actually left wing. But it's a left wing that needs to be improved, needs to lose the campism, uh, needs clearer messages, needs to be actually oriented around the struggle for social revolution, and so on. Let's continue. Teeth, are, teeth in the U.S. are a commodity. How often do Americans go to the dentist? In Belgium, it is normal to go twice a year. Yeah, ideally, you would go twice a year. Get a cleaning. Uh, you don't get x-rays every single time, but yes, ideally, you would go for a cleaning twice a year. Uh, I haven't gone as much during the pandemic because uh, there is um, a heightened risk of infection. Uh, but that said, you should still go as, as often as you can. I mean, well, not as not like every day, but um, as as close to every six months as, as you can. Um, look around for dental facilities that let you pay out of pocket. Sometimes, you know, you can pay like 100, you know, 150 bucks, something like that. I mean, you probably are able to scrounge up 100 bucks twice a year. Um, anyway, you know, there's also uh, a lot of them have sliding scales. So if you tell them that, you know, tell them like, I'm poor. Do you have like a sliding scale? You can ask that. Um, so, yeah. It's definitely been a number of years since I've been to the dentist. A lot of Americans don't get dental and just a regular cleaning experience is fairly expensive. Um, yeah, it's bad too because uh, if you don't get a cleaning and a few years go by, your odds of getting a cavity go way, way up. And then not only do you still need the cleaning, you also need to get a filling. So yeah, all kinds of problems there. Dentist tries to charge me like $500 for a deep clean, not covered by insurance. So always check beforehand, call around. Uh, there's certain like chain dental facilities that I've seen that you should stay away from. You know, read the reviews and things like that. But um, odds are if you poke around, a lot of dentists are, are aware of the situation. And again, many of them offer sliding scales where you may be able to find something you know, affordable. We can debate whether it's whether it's reasonable or not. And welcome, Sal. I've never had a cleaning in my life, and I don't get the tooth pulled until I feel like I'm going to die. You shouldn't do that because um, dental health. Uh, I mean, I, again, I know money doesn't grow on trees. This is really important, though. Um, dental health, gum health is tied to heart health. Uh, people who have, I mean, if you're not doing that, you need to at least at a minimum be flossing like at least once a day, maybe twice a day, brushing your teeth at least twice a day. Um, an electric toothbrush is going to be better than a manual toothbrush. Um, it just, it runs for longer and you get a better cleaning. Uh, that's at least going to stretch out the time that you can afford to take between cleanings. But you really need to, to do that because it, it can impact other not only do you need your teeth, and that's key, and you can save yourself some pain, but it can impact uh, other areas of your health, like, you know, heart attacks and things like that, too. You know, remember, everything in your body is sort of floating around in a watery environment, and there's a lot of uh, interaction between different parts of your body. Uh, random comment, but apparently I was in some Dead Space YouTuber video recently. I made a reply to some fascist piece of shit in the YouTube comments on a previous video. Uh, yeah, they made a helicopter comment. And... Yeah, I mean, people who think that... I mean, I, you know, it, it might not be worth engaging <laughs> with the, the fascist in the YouTube comments where there's no ability to block people or stuff like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, liberals tend to just think that, like, politeness is going to somehow solve the world's problems. Um, politeness can be a valuable thing in certain situations, but, uh, it's not going to defeat fascism, I'll tell you that.
What's your opinion on globalization versus protectionism broadly? Broadly. How about what's... that? I would not consider that a central issue. Um, the issue is not... So you can't divorce these things from class struggle. Uh, you can't just talk about globalization on its own because the world proletarian revolution is a is a form of globalization um you know globalization of capital is a different thing that's like in the under the heading of imperialism um so i think that things like that you, you cannot divorce them from class analysis how do you send a dm on here it's called messages no whispers it's called whispers that's what it is there is an active communist community on tiktok but i really think they need to talk about organizing a lot more well i hope they can do it in under three minutes now i didn't they uh recently up the time limit on tiktok i don't know i just like i said i i find that video format just really annoying it's like good for raising questions and really bad for answering questions and so i tend to find tiktoks like massively um, unsatisfying. So we got a link here. Train derails Paulsboro, New Jersey, releasing 23,000... When is this from? <clears throat> 23,000 gallons of vinyl chloride. That's the same thing that was released... Oh, it's from 2012. Okay, that's why I didn't hear about it. So that's from Noah. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Okay. Noah's Office of Response and Restoration. Train derails in Paulsboro, New Jersey, releasing 23,000 gallons of toxic vinyl chloride gas. That's a horrifying picture. Okay. There is no masking in Europe except in hospitals. Yeah, that's what it's like in the U.S. now, too. I mean, I remember going for a COVID test, even when we had mask mandates, which please bring back mask mandates. But, uh, I mean, by the way, you know, I know that the uh, peace rally is a peace rally uh, coming up on the 18th. Can we do something about COVID? Somebody show up with some COVID, <clears throat> some COVID signs. We need to get a movement going on that as well. Um, how was I just going to say? Oh, yeah, I remember going for a PCR test and I was wearing an N95. They made me take it off and put a surgical mask on. They're like, no, to come into this facility, you have to wear a surgical mask. I'm like, my N95 is vastly superior to that surgical mask. Still, that was that was the deal. So there, there I am, more exposed, because I went into a hospital, they wouldn't let me wear the N95. Hey, how you doing? <clears throat> the feed doesn't let you know when we go live. I don't know. I don't know. I don't claim to know how Twitch works. Hello to all the people coming in. We got 61 people in. Hello. I'm way back in the chat. I For people who are new to this, I do try to treat this as a discussion and I go through the chat uh, sequentially, so... reading through just tuning in i like that jason unruh video that you shared although i think its focus was mostly on the larouche crowd that are very pro-russia i think that the biggest roadblock is getting over china being socialist or not this multipolarity mindset seems to prop up china like a savior is it just some kind of desperation on people's part um i mean i used to be heavily into china is going to lead the world mindset for a while after the BRICS talk here during an s 4 live stream. I've been questioning my ideas on China. Yeah, so, I mean, we, you know, when we started these live streams a year, a year ago, um, you know, as I made clear, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you're trying to do this, but, um, you know, I made clear this wasn't just like a debate bro stream or whatever. <clears throat> and as I've said, you know, 
And by the way, sorry, for people just skipping ahead to this part, I am uh, having some kind of a sinus issue, so um, hence my I'm clearing my throat a little bit more even than usual. Um, you know, the China thing, I, you know, as I said, uh, the audience when I did a poll on this seemed to be split pretty much 50-50 on do you consider China to either be socialist or moving towards it? Um, and, uh, or, you know, have they just abandoned <clears throat> socialism? And again, the audience was about 50-50 split on that. Um, I think the confusing thing, and it has confused me in, in my analysis previously, is China is building social democracy on top of socialism, and there are still a lot of remnants of socialism left over. Versus, like, when we got social democracy in the United States, it was built on top of robber baron capitalism. So everything seemed like progress. In that case, uh, there's still socialism, or again, at least remnants of the legacy of socialism in China left over. It wasn't like a complete destruction like was done in the USSR. Um, and so you can look at some of those statistics and see the potential still there. At the same time, it's really, I think, foolish to ignore, you know, we, we've looked at a few um, uh, things. Let me put one up on the, the screen here. Um, oh, come on. So I've shown this in, in previous ones before. If you look at China, 1995 to 2018, um, the private sector being their main economic driver, in urban employment, it went from 18% of the Chinese economy to 87%. <clears throat> Exports, 34% to 88% over that time period. Fixed asset investment, 42% to 65%. And then more recently, um, you can look at things like, where did this go? I was just looking at it earlier. Um, China's private sector has grown bigger over the last 10 years, kind of by a lot. Now, this is a different sect uh, or a different type of analysis. This is the total market value of China's top 100 listed enterprises. Uh, started out as 8% private enterprises in 2010, and then the total market value of China's top 100 in 2020 went up to 50%. So there is really, really substantial growth of. Um, of capitalism in China. And you just kind of can't look away from that because capitalism, as we know, has various needs. And I still think that there's potential in China. I mean, again, they um, really, uh, they have an actual legacy of socialism and an actual history of that and inspiration for that. I mean, that said, I do think that there need to be major changes in order for that to come back. Now, again, they say that they're doing this by 2050. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe they are. It so far looks like they're going away from it and not towards it. So I agree with you that I think that it's a major question that, uh, you know, and then your question where is it? Uh, is it just some kind of desperation on people's part? You have a number of political parties instructing people that China is, in fact, socialist and that you should basically trust whatever they say on that front, um, especially when you get into the very shallow waters of most social media. You'll find a lot of that. And so it's not entirely individual desperation. Some of it is also, I think, organized revisionism. We're going to talk about CPUSA later in the stream. They're one of the parties that does that. So, um, yeah, no, I, I like the Unruh video too. And, uh, you know, it's nice to have other channels. It wasn't like Unruh was the first person to say that alongside, you know, S4A saying it. Others, including Marxist Paul and Prolicold and Paul Sturm have also made similar assessments. Uh, but it, the more the merrier because... I think um, also this is something particular to the YouTube communist space and I think really particularly to the kind of commenters, even the specific commenters, found uh, on Jason Unruh's channel. I used to have a lot more comment commenter overlap with uh, MRN and with other you know channels kind of in that orbit 
and I noticed that I stopped seeing so many of those people, and it's not just because I banned them. Actually, we had Second Chances Day not that long ago, and I still didn't see a lot of the people come back, which is fine. Um, but in 2020, when we were starting S4A in the first year of it, uh, I saw a lot of the people who I still see commenting over there regularly um, had, you know, got into gotten into arguments with me, except my, my end of the argument was coming from something that I had read where you could really, really clearly demonstrate, um, you know, that a particular line was revisionist or opportunist, like whatever. And I would point that out. And I, you know, I started this project not to make friends, not to bullshit, but to learn and to actually make efforts towards, you know, doing what I can to uh, help to rebuild the international communist movement. And that involves things like doing, uh, you know, widespread baseline education. I don't think I'm going to be able to organize people. I'm not, you know, not going to take that particular conceit. Um, but as far as doing general agitation and education with a focus on quality, yeah, I'm here for that. And I'm not here to just be buddy buddy with people who have like absurd positions. Um, so uh, the point about the comment section is I got very tough on people promoting dumb shit. I don't think Unruh uh, moderates his comments. And so I see the people who I kicked out long ago still continually posting over there and they refuse to learn anything and that's you know i want to go forward with this project not stand still i can also tell you i think it's one of the reasons why s4a has grown rather than staying in place is because of that emphasis on quality and finding the correct position not just sort of like hanging out um and tolerating a bunch of garbage in the comments no no serious person is going to want to tolerate that sort of situation long term. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, Jason Unruh has been going for a long time. I think his really old content from like 10 years ago, uh, people have largely forgotten about at this point. It was, I think, a Jason Unruh with a lot more morale for the channel. You know, I think... Um, facing 10 years of trolls and shit has really worn him down. And this is another thing that happens when you don't moderate the comments and block people and, and things like that. Um, I didn't want to go that route, so I decided to protect myself better from it, you know, as far as uh, keeping this thing moving forward and not just letting a bunch of people, like, scream obscenities at me. Um, you can't entirely stop people from doing that, but you can stop them from doing it a second time. You know what I mean? So, uh, there's that. It's nice to see these sort of like, uh, stirrings to life of a channel like that. But I think that, um, it needs to happen with like a lot more regularity. And I think that, you know, the, the movement as a whole needs to kind of, uh, get serious in a way that, again, you know, I had a lot of these same commenters over at S4A back in 2020. I don't miss a lot of them because they're not here for to do anything serious and I don't know anyway hopefully that's clear I know I kind of rambled there, I guess my point about all of that is there's a lot that I find shockingly disappointing about you know the closer that I have gotten to the existing uh, movement for communism and looking for quality within it seems like all of the major organizations have some uh, you know pretty significant problem even something like China, where, you know, the Chinese government was never uh, destroyed the same way that the USSR was. I think people go into looking at that with more hope and optimism. The reality, though, I think is somewhat less appealing, uh, you know, from a socialist perspective than, than one would like. I'm not saying it's all awful, but I think that it deserves a lot more criticism than it typically gets. But... A lot of people in the, quote, you know, Western left or U.S. left have not done the reading. They have no real uh, basis um, of Marxism-Leninism to stand on. And so they're kind of just going off of peer pressure on social media as far as what their actual position is going to be. And, you know, that's just everybody kind of behaving like, uh, you know, according to peer pressure and in echo chambers and 
kind of just following each other around in circles. So you got to do the reading, you got to take it seriously, and you've got to look at the practical implications of all of this as far as actually building a movement, actually working towards revolution, and so on. Because those, those are the actual things we have to do. So when I say, you know, I didn't come into this to like make friends or anything like that, that's not to say comrades will not be found along the way. That's not the primary thing. I don't want to have, you know, friends for the sake of having friends. I want uh, to encounter other people who are seriously committed communists who share these same goals. I'm doing this for political reasons, not, you know, social life reasons, in other words. And um, I find precious few people seem to share that viewpoint. Uh, I mentioned Politstern before. There's an organization that is not a party yet, but they seem to have a lot of the same orientation with respect to those questions. I may read their about page at some point in the future, but um, that's about the closest I've seen to something that looks uh, promising so far. Anyway, continuing uh, through the comments. I have had asthma-like symptoms since I got COVID. It honestly really sucks. Yeah, I, I had uh, long COVID for pretty much all of 2021, breathing difficulties. I feel like I still have some breathing difficulties, but it's uh, it was bad that year. I think I heard somewhere that China made some kind of deal with Belarus. Isn't Lukashenko an outright fascist? Yeah, I saw something about that in passing. Let me see if I can bring it up real quick. Somebody was um, DMing me about that. Let me see if I can bring it up. Uh, all right, if Twitter would load, that'd be great. All right, now where were we here? China, China, Lukashenko. So this is from TASS.com, T-A-S-S. News about Lukashenko's visit came after China had released a document on the situation in Ukraine. Experts point out Belarus may express support for Beijing's vision of resolving the Ukrainian crisis, although they have had to play very close to the Russian point of view, uh, or they have been at least, I don't know if they have to, but they have been uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, there is a focus on territorial integrity, and we know that Belarus has not yet legally recognized even Crimea, let alone the new Russian regions. Lukashenko could support this plan, especially since Russia does not oppose it. Uh, let's see. So Lukashenko, this is from TASS, Russian news agency. Uh, this is from yesterday, February 28. Press review, Lukashenko takes concerns to China and Blinken heading to Central Asia. Top stories from the Russian press on Tuesday. February 28, uh, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko begins his three-day visit to China, while U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is embarking, on a, uh, is embarking on a Central Asian tour, and the grain export deal is likely to be extended. These stories topped Tuesday's newspaper headlines across Russia. So, three-day visit to China by Lukashenko. Uh, they believe that the Belarusian leader will seek to strengthen ties with Beijing and may also express support for China's position on the Ukraine conflict. Quote, like Russia, we are pivoting to the east and view China, India, and other Eurasian countries as our key markets. So let me just say, I mean, Russia was perfectly happy selling its products to the west. This is not, like, this is entirely economic. It has nothing to do with politics or, like, the, uh, I mean, the, the decision to, uh, in the sense of um, trying to, you know, some East versus West um, cultural conflict or something like that. That's really not what it's about at all. Uh, there's so many things framed in that way, and it's honestly just kind of sad to see people falling for that. Russia was completely happy to sell their oil and gas to Europe. Now that they can't, and there's a price cap being put on Russian oil of $60 if they sell, uh, if any country pays more than $60, uh, for Russian oil, then that country will be sanctioned as well. Um, Russia has had to find places to dump their oil at really cheap prices and get around uh, the, the lowered price by increased volume. So, <clears throat> I mean, 
<clears throat> they're between a rock and a hard place there. Also, anyone knows that India and China are not great friends. Um, and, you know, as far as like lumping them together, this is one of the criticisms of the BRICS thing is that this is not a homogeneous group at all. Um, they literally BRICS is is a term coined by Goldman Sachs as like an emerging market investment strategy. Um, that's what BRICS is. And it's not that the countries really have that much in common, except that they were emerging markets where Western investors could sink some capital. That's it. So, I mean, as far as the politics and, and beyond that, it's really uh, quite different. So this whole like pivot to China, Russia's doing it sheerly out of like desperation that they need somewhere to keep selling their oil to. Um, you know, but it, it, people try to make way, way, way too much of this as far as squinting to see socialism that just isn't there or anti-imperialism that isn't there. Again, there's no meaningful anti-imperialism without socialism. But anyway, um, skimming through this article, this is a, actually a fairly long article, so I have to come back to this later. But So the comment was, I think I heard somewhere that China made some kind of deal with Belarus. I mean, China's trying to survive as well, and they're feeling some of the cold shoulder growing from the U.S. as well. Obviously, um, you know, the U.S. and its allies are showing their willingness to turn on the sanctions against even countries as big as Russia. And, you know, China is just got big. <clears throat> China just built itself up to this point, really in like the last 10 years, and they don't want to lose it so quickly. So they want to stay in the game. They want to stay in the picture. And, you know, they're going to do what they have to for that. Absent from all of this is questions of social revolution. You know, how do you actually, like, there's the whole question of surviving capitalism and all that and needing a bigger seat at the table within the global order of exploiters. Um, the way out of all of this is through social revolution. So not competing within capitalism, but ending it on a worldwide scale. That, that, that just doesn't seem to be anywhere in the discussion. And that's my problem with these people. Like, oh, we're anti-imperialists. They literally will never talk about ending capitalism. Just sort of uh, propping up some lesser capitalists and like rooting for the underdog. That's their, quote, anti-imperialism. It's not anti-imperialism because if that underdog gets any bigger, it will behave exactly like the bigger one. That, okay, you know, you hate. And that hatred for the USA is well-deserved. USA has done atrocious things and continues to keep doing them don't support that obviously but the actual answer to that is socialism not any kind of opportunistic exploitation that just happens to not be um, approved by the US you know or that takes a little bit of money out of the hands of the US it's it pales in comparison to what the US is doing it's not an effective strategy for undermining the US um, and it gets us no closer, really, to socialism at all. The primary thing is always organizing for social revolution. These external conditions, as we've discussed before, are always secondary. They can have an effect, but they're always secondary. And if you're not doing that primary thing, then that, that's really what determines the question of where do we go from here. Yeah, the China thing, it's, it is complicated, actually. But um, they have been allowing a massive amount of capitalism. And I think, you know, bottom line, it deserves a lot more criticism and I, than it's getting. I don't think that the conversation around that is super honest. And, uh, you know, when I have tried to ask simple questions and introduce some, you know, basic data points about it, I, I have become increasingly less and less impressed with the pro-China folks over the last three years. Uh, they never have good answers to any of the questions. It's a propaganda level understanding that they're promoting and it's not substantive. So where I do find more substance is on the critical side. Hence, I have been a lot more critical of China. So and we'll cover things m more to that effect, you know, over the course of this year and, and beyond. So, all right. Uh, 
I should honestly go get an inhaler. That's the least disappointing long-term symptom I got, though. Ever since I had COVID, I'll just drop things out of my hand, which sucks because it affects my guitar playing. I'm sorry to hear that. I don't know if it's related or if I have a different underlying condition, but the doctors I've seen about it seem to brush it off. Yeah, that's what doctors are very, very good uh, at. It's like my hand stops working correctly for half a minute. Um, muscle and nerve problems are one of the most common long, long COVID symptoms. So yeah, it entirely could be that. There's a bill in Texas that defines what you can and can't wear in public as a man or woman. If you don't follow these norms, it's a felony. Can I get a link on that or just throw it in tater tube? Um, that would be interesting to see. Fashion police, literally. I mean, we already know there's, you know, a variety of things going on with, um, you know, uh, racist um, hair and clothing laws. Now it's going to extend to sort of every marginalized group. And again, Texas. I have a friend of mine who's hardcore liberal, and he starts by trying to minimize COVID. And when I show him the data, he just brushes it away, saying, what do you expect anyone to do? I don't know, something. Uh, mask mandates, testing, bring testing back. Mask mandates and PCR testing on a weekly basis would be an enormous step forward. So there you go. Those are two very simple, concrete things. Also, improve ventilation and filtration. So there's three things. Uh, look up the hashtag Davos Safe, D A V O S Safe, S A F E, uh, for more, because it's this concept of recently the World Economic Forum gathered, the richest people in the world. Guess what? They had UV lights going, they had PCR tests to get into the facility. They take COVID seriously. These are the richest people in the world, and they're trying to protect themselves from the thing that they're telling you isn't a big deal. So all things, our schools should be Davos safe and so on. It's exactly as you described. He doesn't want to face the music when confronted by something they don't want to hear. They focus on the ego like I'm fine after having COVID for now. And most people, you know, like a lot of people aren't and you're fine for now. Anecdotal evidence is really poor. You know, that, that isn't science. Uh, it was just announced yesterday by German Health Minister Karl Lauterbach, or Lauterbach, that we, and we read a story uh, on him before talking about COVID's impact on the immune system. All COVID-19 safety measures would be suspended as of March 1st, meaning today it's worth noting in light of this decision that the SPD politician, who also served uh, as a longtime member on the board of directors of the Rune Kliniken, a leading private hospital group in Germany working in collaboration with the notorious uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung Foundation to close hospitals and steadily privatize health care. So that guy, that's the same guy, isn't it? That he was talking about how COVID is, um, you know, impacts the immune system, which it does. It kills T cells. Uh, let's see. Lauterbach. Yeah, that was the guy. So, okay. Uh, that's called not acting with integrity. Integrity is when your actions, words, and beliefs all line up. So he knows better, but he's doing this. And it's being pushed by the right-wing hospital privatization think tank. Uh, as an addendum, Lauterbach himself was famously lampooned for stating in a tweet posted on March 4, 2019... Quote, everyone knows that we in Germany ought to close every third or second clinic. This would cut costs for other clinics. What? As well as gain them much needed resources and personnel. Yet communities are reluctant. Yeah. I see protesters in France asking for full pension at 60 instead of 40. My question is why not lower it to 50 for male, 45 for female? Why do we give our best years to the capitalists so easily. Yeah, I mean, in the U.S., people here just make excuses. They're like, uh, they buy into every capitalist lie between, behind why we, quote, need to do things like that. I mean, they're at least fighting for 60. You know, I, my guess is they're not going to stop at 60, but you got to set it somewhere to make the demand for today and, and then keep uh, keep pushing and pushing.
But I agree. Um, we also need more social activities because, you know, after people retire, um, work is kind of their whole life. And after people retire, a lot of people die really, really fast after retirement. Or they just sort of fall apart psychologically. And that's a problem where people don't have enough of a life outside work during their working years. And then, of course, you know, after retiring, it's like, what do you do? Like, you know, about as far as uh, people plan is like they're going to play golf or like, uh, you know, some of them are going to like play golf or maybe they travel a little bit. You know, they'll just drive their adult children crazy or whatever. Uh, but yeah, we need uh, we need more, you know, uh, community activities, uh, sports leagues for adults. This is more common in Europe than in the U.S., but people need to have lives. It's like everybody just goes home, pulls the shades, turns on the TV and just like rots in isolation. It, we talked about this before, but um, I, I see this as connected. Speaking of 9-11 and U.S. Empire, have you read The Grand Chessboard? Uh, it's big new Brzezinski wrote the grand chessboard he was an advisor to jimmy carter and then i think also obama later um yeah i mean there's statements in that like whoever controls central a central asia is going to control you know the most critical geopolitical uh, like you know fulcrum of the world so i mean no i have not read the whole book no um it was discussed a lot during the 2000s in the anti-war movement as far uh, as far as the U.S.'s motivations for getting into Afghanistan and Iraq and, and etc. This is my parody of the Northfolk Southern What's Your Function advertisement song. Northfolk Southern What's Your Functioning See, and it messed it up on the first line. What's your function? Poisoning your communities with toxic chemicals. Northfolk Southern What's Your Function? Disregarding safety in the name of profit. It could be catchier, but it is accurate. After the Guardian article, I realized why the U.S. is uh, lacking life expectancy. Yeah, it is, it is declining overall, and it's declining for certain populations, like American Indians, a lot more. As for environmental racism, even Bernie is guilty of this, who advocated storing nuclear waste just outside of a mostly Hispanic town. I missed that one. What state was that in? All water and wastewater plants are subject to the FOIA request. That's Freedom of Information Act. You can go and inspect the DMR labs and minutes. If they're not up to spec, you can raise hell. That is good to know. Wasn't the Rage Against the War Machine a people party thing? Could have sworn it was organized by that predator, Nick Brana. Yes, that predator part is true. Uh, Nick Brana, or it, it alleged uh, to be true. Uh, but it, it is true that there are allegations, is what I was saying. Uh, Zana Day, who was a, an employee of Nick Brana of the Movement for a People's Party, um, accused him of uh, sexual assault and exploitation as as his employee he, uh, she posts on uh, social media regularly so you can read all about it there but yeah so in movement for a people's party it's not actually a party it is um you know the accused rapist podcast grifter party uh they don't run candidates they just collect money they've been doing this for years and years now they don't stand for anything at best it is a watering down of the green party but again they don't even run fucking candidates now you're correct they got they were co-hosting the rage against the war machine rally it's how you get jimmy Dore and chris hedges and the other mpp affiliated people there but again it's not a real party the libertarian party which was the other co-host however uh is a real party it's the third i mean it's loathsome but it's actually a real political party it's active, you know, in all 50 states, and it's the third largest political party in the U.S. Uh, because it poses absolutely no threat to the system. Literally, the Libertarian Party just advocates the same neoliberal agenda that the Democrats and Republicans do, plus weed, although a lot of states are uh, decriminalizing weed anyway. So, <laughs> you know, without the, cannab the cannabis plank, uh, Libertarians don't have a lot to stand on. 
Uh, but it's literally, they call for the same neoliberalism that the Democrats and Republicans do, just even, they're even more hardcore about it. So, yeah, I say it's primarily the Libertarian Party because they're a real party with real organizers, whereas MPP isn't. But again, if you're going to host a part, and again, you know, the Green Party uh, wasn't overall foolish enough to do that. The Green Party, uh, some places where their sort of right wing is bigger than their left wing, will sometimes do things with the Libertarian Party. The Libertarians are constantly looking to drag the Green Party down with them into their stew of right wing politics. Uh, the Green Party will often reject the Libertarian Party, but not always. And it's unfortunate when they don't. For example, Jill Stein, who I see as not being from the better wing of the Green Party, uh, she was uh, tweeting enthusiastically about this Rage Against the War Machine rally. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, as they say, divide one into two. Uh, the Green Party has more of a left socialist wing, you know, that Howie Hawkins eco socialist kind of side. There are some actual socialists in that party. They don't organize, you know, by democratic centralism or, you know, anything like that. But you, you get people who are actually socialist. And then you get the right wing of the Green Party is more in that contrarian, populist, uh, you know, libertarian sort of thing. So, yeah, the Green Party's right wing is not appealing and they will work sometimes with libertarians. It doesn't help the Green Party and it just gives left cover to the libertarians. That's not something you, you don't want to help the Libertarian Party. Even if they were to uh, turn back the clock on the accumulation of capital, talking about Libertarians, a more free market capitalism, then it would be inevitably progressing towards the monopolization. Yeah, exactly. Every time we, like, uh, the Libertarian Party, I think, was founded in 1970. So pretty much the start of the declaration of the neoliberal project. Then it went fully mainstream in 1980 with the Reagan-Bush presidency and Morning in America and all that stuff. Well, since then, we've had a steady stream of deregulation and privatization, basically the libertarian agenda. So you can see what it's gotten us. More consolidation of capital, etc., etc., etc. Yet, because they're so confused uh, about, you know, historical development and class uh, struggle, class relations, etc. They just keep saying, no, it's not deregulated enough. That's the problem. It's still socialism. No, it was never socialism. Uh, it was always capitalism, just somewhat regulated. And now it's like almost completely deregulated. And they're still, they're like, oh, it's more socialist than ever. You're literally blaming socialism, non-existent socialism for the actual problems of capitalism which your party helped to cause. So that's libertarians in a nutshell. Exactly. They're, they're calling for a cure which will worsen the disease. Hi from France, everyone. Happy to hear from you. Welcome. Uh, I hate how I have to keep uh, having to refresh because the stream freezes and I lose all the chat. Yeah, I know. Once I get this going, I just leave it alone and try to touch it as little as possible. Uh, let's see. Turning on the stream now after closing up to the public at work. Well, happy to help uh, get you through the end of your work day. In Sweden, we have free health care. Everything in the body except everything in the head, mouth, eyes, ears, and psyche is not free. All that is expensive as hell. Very strange, I think. Yeah, well, you know, they don't care if you're mentally suffering, uh, you know. <laughs> or it is bizarre but this is the way that they've carved off specialists um the thing is like everybody needs that kind of care so i mean that was one thing when bernie sanders was calling for medicare for all he was also calling it for it to be expanded to dental care which i think they don't get in canada either so this actually would have made the u.s uh med medical system have better coverage than canada I mean, everywhere that there's nationalized um, health care, it's been under attack and, you know, having cuts and things like that. The U.S., we never even have had it.
The space comrades will come to save us before China will. Yeah. The comment was phrased a little bit differently. I changed it, but food for thought. Praying to the aliens. I invite you to come live in a South American socialist country for one month and you would change your mind. What country would that be, person who won't be answering because they're banned? Thoughts on Grover Fur? I, I have not really seen a reason to delve into that so far. No, no Discord. Uh, I don't need to be running a Discord right now. For real, so many people just accept what people say on social media as fact just because they don't want to go against the grain. Absolutely, it's vicious. It's vicious. So that's why you need to know what you're talking about and, you know, stand for that. I had to refute the idea that socialism is just the progressive stage of capitalism. I got dogpiled, but using quotes um, from the proletarian revolution and the renegade Kautsky and the state and revolution, both by Lenin, I got quite a few people to change their mind. Well, that's good. That's good. The insane amount of anti-China propaganda almost makes it hard for me to shit on them that much as an American. What does me shitting on China do but feed the war machine? Well, so, um, we're not shitting on China. We are... As people interested in and attempting to build or rebuild the international communist movement, if what China is doing is not leading towards socialism, then um, we need to be aware of that and not be following that example. So that's the point of it. It's not just shitting on China. Um, and, you know, for people trying to, I'm not saying you are, but for people you encounter who may be making it out that way, um, that, you know, that's not really good faith. Like, the the whole point is, if what they're doing is actually restoring capitalism, but calling it building socialism, then uh, that's not an example we need to follow. In fact, we need to criticize it and don't go down with that ship. Because social revolution will make all of this obsolete. You know, uh, the day after the revolution, you can make a quantum leap forward in terms of the you know reforms that you can actually make permanent, um, you don't entirely change everyone in the country's thinking overnight. So you need a proletarian state to keep um, you know enforcing proletarian rule and do the work of building socialism, which takes it's not instantaneous. But um, if you're taking as your model something that isn't socialist, that's not going to serve you at all. So what we need to do is put all of this sort of peer pressure shit behind us, like we're not in middle school anymore, and consider the actual stakes, which are uh, building socialism or not, building a movement capable of social revolution or not. If we don't do that, we're screwed. The good news is we can do it, but we need to minimize mistakes. And I think that that, that is the point. But it's not the same as bourgeois cold war against China. That's not it at all. You know, the USA's criticism of China is not like it's not socialist enough. <laughs> like that's not that's not uh, the thing at all. And yeah, China does not have the same system as the US. It's not identical. That's why I think it is confusing. They have elements of both things. I think the question is more what direction is it going in? Do they really have all this foreign capital that they've allowed in, which is now also turned into domestic capital as well? Um, do they really have it corralled as they claim to do or not? Um, what changes have they made to Chinese society in an effort to pave the way for that capital? And because capital needs workers to exploit. Otherwise, it doesn't make money, and if it can't make money, capital doesn't stay and build its operations somewhere. So what has China done in order to accommodate capital? And where has that been undermining socialism? We need like a much more nuanced discussion of that. Um, that is a topic that I hope to get into. People keep asking me for audiobooks. I, I will keep doing audiobooks. Um, let me you know restate that. I primarily started this channel to get a lot more reading done and also to vent some political thoughts. 
Well, three years later, I've done a lot of reading, um, a lot of reading. And, you know, I didn't just start this channel to like do audiobooks until the end of time. I've do done a lot more streams in 2022. Well, we didn't do any streams before that. Um, but I've kind of shifted to doing more of this. Now that a lot of the reading is under the belt, we will continue with the audiobooks. Uh, but probably not at the same like breakneck pace, although there may be months here and there where I do like a lot of audiobooks. But I increasingly feel like I could post audiobooks till I'm blue in the face, and many people just simply won't listen to them, and they won't respect the fact that I've read them. So, you know, doing that, after a certain point, there's diminishing returns. A after a certain point, I feel like it's not always the best use of my time. And so I am looking to turn to other things uh, that can combat some of the other misconceptions going on. Again, the overall effort here is to improve the left and to build a movement that is actually capable of social revolution. If there is something that I can do through this channel that I think will be in furtherance of those goals, I will do it. If not, you know, I may not. And again, just simply posting a thousand audiobooks for the sake of posting a thousand audiobooks, I mean, that that's not necessarily going to happen. The channel will keep moving forward and different things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I hope that we will pass through different uh, stages of, you know, what are the needs of the movement and are there organizations showing up which show some promise of becoming the thing that we need or, or stuff like that. And, you know, for the first three years, it was about getting to this point. And, you know, the next year or two will be about getting to the point that we get to at that point. But it's not necessarily going to be the same thing the whole time. Anyway, uh, moving, moving forward here. Not to mention that the anti-China propaganda anti-China propaganda directly leads to attacks against East Asian peoples, especially during the early stages of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we, you don't want to contribute to any of that. And, you know, to any sincere comrades in China, like salute, you know, obviously uh, proletarian international solidarity. Absolutely. Um, that's not who the issue is with at all. It's to the extent that revisionism has taken hold in China. We need to be relentlessly scathing towards revisionism. That's that's the issue. I basically live on a military base, family of veterans, etc., and people in the U.S. military are genuinely ready for conflict. That's terrible. But thank you for that. Okay, thank you for the link about all the anti-trans bills. So there's like one article about all the different trans bills, anti-trans bills, okay. Yeah, we covered one of those a few streams ago. Um, yeah. It just, I mean, I'm just shaking my head like that. that's who you have to target with all the problems going on. And look at how many people have fallen for it. It's really bad. Anyone familiar with Nikos Poulantzas? My socialist study group recently discussed an article of his. His views on the state seem pretty good, apart from a deep fear of, quote, Stalinism. No, I have not. Then again, I'm not into Trotskyist stuff, so. When I was a kid, a lot of older people were playing chess. There used to be like a gathering place for pensioners where they could meet and hang out. Slowly, capitalism has screwed us all and we've become strangers. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, this is like just the further enclosure of the commons where there's just not even a space for people to gather at all. It's so deeply antisocial. This is also like in the world of like music and the arts, like just having venues, comparing the early 90s, well, I guess that's 30 years ago now, um, the amount of places that have closed due to like rents going up and other things. There's just, there's like nowhere to go anymore. It's really pretty bad. And so people are trying to make up for it 
by going online and there's some creative stuff happening online it's not the same though it's just not the same as like being in a room with people some time ago I posted Marxist Paul's video on criticism which I thought was very good for learning how to approach other people some comrades who followed me said but he sounds Maoist yeah I've been saying this since the beginning people need to get over that shit like a lot if something is correct that that's what that's what you need to be a correctist um honestly the the amount of sort of um anyway continuing what the hell is going on with some comrades it was a good video on approaching people and bonding with comrades does it matter if we might have some ideological differences right so you know as i was talking about trotskyism earlier uh no i don't support any trotskyism that said, there are some people who are currently Trotskyists who I think are decent people and their heart's in the right place. I think that they're, uh, you know, maybe obsessed, hung up on some of the wrong things. This is the same with anarchists. I think that there's a lot of decent anarchists out there. Anarchism as an ideology, I cannot condone or support. I think it's wrongheaded and ultimately not beneficial. But yeah, I mean, I, I have two Trotsky pieces up on the channel, Fascism and How to Fight It, and another really short piece. You know, and I included lengthy disclaimers like you can read Trotsky uh, or anybody that, you know, led a problematic tendency uh, and, you know, identify what's correct in there without swallowing the ism as a whole. So, yeah, but he sounds Maoist. God forbid. God forbid. But, you know, again, people are so hooked into a lot of kinds of revisionism. They're just, and it's like, have you read it? No, I haven't read it. This is like, um, there's a comment, the commenter eventually pulled back from this. But when I uh, posted the Jason Unruh video um, about opposing Putin worship, um, the video multipolar support for Russia violates Leninism, I posted this in the S4A community, uh, community space. Somebody said, didn't this dude also defend Pol Pot? So they, they pulled back from this and, and that's fine. I, I responded to them. But, you know, instead of spreading innuendo, rumors, and fear, because just even posting a comment like that basically says to other people reading it, oh, if you've ever, like, you know, done anything anyone construes as wrong, that even if it's one thing, and even if it's half understood, that everything else you've ever said is completely worthless. That's not the case. And also, how lazy is it to, when you could just, it, you wanna know what Jason Unruh has to say about Pol Pot? Go to his fucking channel, and it'll take you eight keystrokes, P-O-L space, P-O-T, enter. There's literally one video, it's titled The Truth About Pol Pot, and he says some stuff, and the video's from 10 fucking years ago. It's not like he's made a career out of, quote, defending Pol Pot. What does that even mean anyway? Do you defend Pol Pot against some particular lie that was told about him? Or do you fend, defend everything he did as being like the pinnacle of socialism? Marxism, Leninism, Pol Potism. You know what I mean? It's so lazy just um, kind of circulating these rumors. And I get some people might not realize that that is what they're doing. But for God's sake, stop with the innuendo and uh, you know the whisper campaigns try basing your worldview on facts anyway yes uh marxist paul i asked uh you know what does he consider to be some of the most important uh texts to read and uh one of them was constructive criticism which is available through foreignlanguages.press i will be reading that shortly on the channel we're finishing arlang octobista which happened to be another recommendation and uh, I love Arling Activista so far, activist study from the uh, Communist Party of the Philippines. It's a very good book. More people would do well to actually study it. Um, but again, I post a stream, it gets 1,500 views. I post that, it gets 300, 400 views. And you can see then the level of effort that people are actually willing to put into their studies. A lot of times it's not very much at all. And this is a problem with the movement. And I'm, you know, people are like, oh, you're going to post this audiobook? You're going to post that audiobook? Why? So nobody can listen to it? You know, I've done the reading. Uh, I share the reading with people. 
and people don't necessarily continue doing the reading. Well, you know, if more people like were engaging with that content, then there'd be more of, of a thing there. If more people were not just engaging with it, but showing that they understood it and applying it in ongoing conversations within political parties, on social media, and so forth, then I'd be like, oh, this is really making a difference now. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I keep doing audiobooks, but it's not like they're the hottest thing on the channel. And I think that that's sad because, again, you know, people want to go in for the easy content where there might be some drama, this and that, you don't want to do the studying. Well, that's why you're in a fucking ditch. So you got to do the reading. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. That's something that has been building up on me for a while, watching that. You know, posting perfectly interesting uh, texts that, you know, like change my thinking or advance my thinking on a topic. And they get 200 views. And it's like, then you post some drama thing about g -Jack and it gets 3,000 views in like 48 hours. You know, people have got to, like, get a lot more serious about doing the study. All right. <laughs> Libertarians are Republicans who like to debate the age of consent. Yeah, Republicans don't even debate it. They just, they just go for it outright. No. I mean, I know what you mean, though. The, uh... I mean, libertarians. Yes, they're ba they're just they're just far right Republicans. And I, I had somebody else. Let me read you this comment because I didn't even know how to reply this uh, reply to this. I have it set so that I have to publish comments. Comments just show up, and then I have to like click the check mark for them to appear. I'm doing this after three years of using other strategies, and I find that this works better by far. I wish I had done this from the start. But I had somebody saying that they used to be involved with the Libertarian Party, and um, let's see, where do, where did it go? Okay, so this person uh, looking at the neo-Nazis that show up at Caleb Maupin's uh, after party, after the um, rally uh, against the war, or Rage Against the War Machine rally, said, this is surreal. As a former member of the Libertarian left, to see what is replacing us now that they have run us out to favor alt-right policies. I read that and I was like, what? Are we talking about the same libertarian party? Because it's always been trash. Anyway, it seems obvious to me that this is just the Republican Party Trump dumping, using the libertarians as their dumpster. As their dumpster. It could backfire horribly, though. So they're basically trying to say, oh, everything wrong with the Libertarian Party is because the Republican Party dumped their, like, white nationalists into it. I'm sorry, that is complete, like, if, if I had tried to respond to this comment in more depth in the written form, it, it just, it would have taken, a, like, a book to do it. That's so incredibly wrong. Go back to literally any period of the Libertarian Party's history. And the one exception that I would grant, and I, I mentioned this, is the 1970s. In the 70s, you had some quasi-respectable, I mean, I, I put respectable a bit tongue-in-cheek here. Uh, you had some true freaks in the Libertarian Party in the 1970s. People with just genuinely weird, but almost somewhat poetic and inspiring ideas about human freedom. It wasn't just about hey, we need to, like, open the floodgates on capitalism. You could find some people who, like, genuinely valued human freedom in a way that was celebratory and also just some, like, super strange elements that, you know, the kind of, like, drop out of society and, uh, you know, just live... Some sort of extreme individuals, they weren't out to exploit anybody else, but it was just they were sort of... Uh, doing their own thing in all capital letters. I mean, it didn't take very long before it just got very much co-opted as as it was designed to be in the first place by, you know, class forces and became a total tool of the uh, capitalist class and part of the neoliberal project and all that. But I mean, yeah, unless you're looking... and But even then, I mean, I don't support that super old school libertarian weirdness. But it was at least a little bit better than what it became, which is a sort of like Ron Paul, 
moral majority shit that was just echoing Reagan all throughout the 80s. It was like echoing Reagan, but, you know, Reaganism plus narcotics, basically, <clears throat> was the Libertarian Party. It's always been this way. I mean, it's always had the same, like, racist, capitalist, garbage inclinations that, you know, as a tool of the ruling class, that's exactly what you would expect. So this person responded, uh, and again, I just couldn't do this justice in a written typed comment, but they said up until about 2012 or so, you think the Libertarian Party started having problems only after 2012? Like four years after the Tea Party? Are you kidding me? They were supporting the legal, they meaning the Libertarian Party, were supporting the legalizing of all drugs. Okay, that's not necessarily... Um, you need qualifications on that for it to be a step in the right direction. You can decriminalize things. Like, certain things are not that dangerous, like cannabis, like psychedelics, for example. Um, those are not, you know, opioids and things like that. You can decriminalize opioids and take treatments that don't involve putting people in jail and things like that. What you can't do is just simply, you know, uh, put up, you know, billboards for heroin and shit like that. So th there are qualifications that um, need to be put in place in order to actually break, um, you know, the, the, the drug epidemic and the uh, opioid ed epidemic. And yeah, some of that comes uh, through the pharmaceutical system. But again, I'll remind you, those are legal. Uh, they are controlled substances, but um, that's what you would want them to be is controlled substances because they're extremely dangerous. Anyway, um, yeah, so just simply, uh, we're for the legalizing of all drugs. Look for what the Libertarian Party is about, deregulating and privatizing everything. So they, they just want to make money off of that. They don't really give a shit about human suffering. They use the human suffering as leverage for their shit-talking points, but that's not really what they're about. No borders. Yeah, again, under capitalism, that's a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, or at least in order to make it work at all, like, yeah, can you have, um, you know, if, if the right to migration is a human right, could we make a better system for that? But what they want is freedom for capital. And it's always going to be a double standard system under capitalism. So no borders, it's probably going to strengthen capital. If it wasn't going to, the libertarians wouldn't be for it. Abolishing the Federal Reserve. Tell, explain to me why this is at all something I would be interested in. They want to go back to the gold standard. Hey, guess who controls the gold? Yes, also capitalists. And they want to get rid of the income tax system. Again, why am I interested in that? Uh, ending all military intervention? No, they don't. That's just bullshit. They will quickly find their system can't exist without it. Uh, and so-called foreign aid, which was just a scam anyway... Uh, true in some ways, not true in others. So again, you have a garbage political platform, which we've broken it down here. I've read the platform of the Libertarian Party in an audiobook here on the channel. It's just like, let's go back to 1776 stuff. It's not suitable for advanced capitalism. It's not suitable for the modern world. It's not suitable for winning the class war for proletarians at all. Uh... So they anyway, they go on and talk about being wrong. A few other things I liked were gaining popularity, but not universally accepted. Okay, well, if you like those things, I don't know, we have a lot in common. Um, the left in the group was mostly Georgians, atheists, and anarcho-communists. The main difference seems to be in order of operations. Both types of communists want to eliminate concentrated power. It's just what side, state, or bank needs to go down first. No, so again, you don't understand that. The state is a product of class society. You can't have the bank without the state. And to the extent that libertarians, quote, you know, want to abolish the government, in quotes, it's just to free up room for capital. It's not for workers, right? Like, that's what the, what, when they say we want to get rid of the government, they want to get rid of the regulations that workers fought for and gained as concessions. That's what they want. They want to make the economy uh, like into even more of a casino than it already is, and basically our lives, you know, rise and fall on their wins and losses. We have no control over it. It's not democratic at all. 
So, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's not true at all. Anarchists fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the state. So you just hate each other's approach. No, their approach is objectively wrong. It can be demonstrated as such, but you have a lot in common. Like, this person's talking to me like I know nothing about anarchists. It's just bizarre. Uh, I'm skeptical of the socialist approach because every time we have a socialist revolution, happens a lot, or what are you saying? Some form of fascism takes over, unlike capitalism, which never turns into fascism ever. In fact, the United States has never spread right-wing libertarian type political programs into other countries so that they will impose a policy of austerity and uh, put them in the thrall of the United States. That's literally what it exists to fucking do. This is why they love Pinochet and so on. So just absurd. I mean, and let's deal with the comment, oh, socialism always seems to turn into some kind of fascism. Note that they didn't qualify that comment at all. So you can't even address it because it's just like, what, am I supposed to accept that as a truism? It isn't. And then again, meanwhile, what actually turns into capitalism, uh, fascism? Capitalism. Fascism is capitalism in crisis. I don't know how this person even found their way to the channel here, but I'm skeptical of the socialists approach because it seems like every time we, yeah, that was that. I think Lenin had the right idea, but I have no faith in it. Okay, great. Get out of my sight. You know what I mean? It's just like, where are you going with this? He had the right idea, but it'll never work. Okay, enjoy capitalism, because that's all you're ever going to get thinking like that. I thought Jill Stein was to the left of Howie. Nope. I remember Howie promoting Russiagate and Stein not. Neither seemed that principled. No, you remember people saying that Howie Hawkins propagated Russiagate. He did not. Watch the clips. Um, that's not really what he was saying. And now in hindsight, with the Russia war going on and her appearing at this Rage Against the War Machine rally, would you maybe consider reevaluating what her stance on the, quote, you know, opposing Russiagate actually was? I agree that it's absurd. You know, Hillary Clinton not campaigning properly and being a shit candidate that was offering no change in a time where people desperately want change. That was the problem why the Democrats lost. They're a terrible party, uh, and that's why they're a terrible party. But um, maybe, you know, re reconsider some of the positions Jill Stein has taken in that light. I was laughing so hard when the Hoover Institute had probably the last interview with Milton Friedman. Uh, the guy was literally talking about anarcho-capitalism, even though it needs painkillers to stay afloat money injected from the feds he was really off the rails it doesn't work i mean it's it's this psychotic death dream of capitalism that's what we're in right now and we have to build the thing that will come after that is our task when it when it comes to fellow proles who ignorantly believe in capitalism i genuinely think it's from a close to if not complete lack of critical thinking skills. You're correct. And that reminds me, there's a text that I have been uh, wanting to do on the channel. This is something I actually truly am. Uh, there's a good book I encountered a while back asking the right questions. And let me see if I can grab a copy of this. Oh yeah, good. Good. What's the most recent edition? Well, I'll come back to that later, but thank you for reminding me of that. Because yes, a systematic just entry point into basic critical thinking, evaluating reasoning, evaluating the uh, quality of evidence, that is key to any kind of social scientific thinking, absolutely. Most predators are in right-wing institutions. It is total projection to accuse, you know, trans people of being, uh, you know, groomers and sexualizing children. Absolutely. Another comment is very telling that all these, quote, alpha male heterosexual types also spend every day of their lives obsessed with trans people. Again, you know, if this is, uh, I, I, you know, I asked one of these people, I'm like, 
I don't care if someone wants to be trans. Like, that doesn't affect me in any way, let alone hurt me. Why do you care? He just literally had no answer. Uh, I'm in talks with a Maoist group of joining their organization. This will be my first communist org I join if I do. My goal of 2023 is one, join an org, two, read more theory, three, push for a united federated front of communists. I do think we will, we will reach that point as the movement gets stronger. Uh, dedicated communists who have actually done some reading become more numerous and so on. Um, we will continue to hash out the positions, people will coalesce around them, and so on. It, it will happen, it is happening now. Uh, like I said, I, I plan to read Politsturm's statement uh, here on the channel. Um, I don't have time for it today, but um, I think that their uh, statement about what their organization is about uh, pretty much matches up with my own thinking about the state of things today. And they're not just based in the U.S., which is another plus. I remember those Pat Sox trying to say that land back was astroturfed by Amazon. Just lol, they will say anything, they're so desperate. Absolutely. I'd rather work with Maoists and anarchists than the Pat Sox, fascists, and Maupinites. Absolutely. I mean, the Pat Sox, fascists, and Maupinites aren't left, so... You know, they don't represent our class interests. Maoists and anarchists do. Um, you know, they're at least aiming for something uh, similar. And, and yeah. Now, I know that there's, um, you know, uh, anarchism has been described as a petty bourgeois ideology. It's followed by a lot of people who are proletarian, which I didn't understand what that meant at first when I encountered that. But it's followed by a lot of people who are proletarian. However, um, anarchism itself is suffused with petty bourgeois individualist consciousness. It puts the individual ahead of the class and l seeks liberation of the individual directly rather than liberation of the individual through liberation of the class to which the individual belongs. And as such, it is this sort of individualist petty bourgeois uh, philosophy. So the good news is if you've made it that far, you know, you're pretty close, um, just kind of need to come over to, you know, people will often make them, I think, genuinely mistaken statement that Marx was kind of an anarchist and in some ways anarchists are the true Marxist. No, Marx and Engels, like there was anarchism back in their day. They had exchanges with uh, Bakunin, like, so uh, they, up on the channel, we have a playlist, Marxists on Anarchism. And this didn't start with Lenin. Marx and Engels were very much down on the Bakuninist approach. There's a good one um, called The Bakuninists at Work. It's an account of a failed revolution in Spain. Uh, or it's, I mean, the bourgeois revolution in Spain around 1870, a few years on either side. And how the anarchists, or Bakuninists, um, led the most ineffective possible uprising. So that. So again, I think a lot of anarchists have their head, I mean, they're, they're, they're hard in the right place. Um, I can't endorse anarchism though, but I think that there's potential there for, you know, and maybe not everyone. Yeah. And keep in mind, a lot of internet anarchists are, um, uh, basically just rad libs. I mean, you get like the Vosh, I'm an anarchist thing. No, you're a fucking Democrat. Uh, you're not, a, you're like, you're not an anarchist. But um, even the committed anarchists, you will see them making a lot of errors in their, you know, uh, a lot of them have adopted some kind of anti-communist position. And they make a lot of errors and they get um, fed into the hands of the ruling class as a result of it. And you can, you can see this, so... Uh, yeah, it's just a kid who thinks politics in terms of the political compass chart of a quote libertarian side where some of both the right and left agree on some concept of quote liberty as opposed to the quote authoritarian leftists and rightists. Yeah, that is the Nolan chart. 
uh, is made by a Libertarian Party activist specifically to promote the Libertarian Party. It's like, hey, do you like freedom? Like, what fucking person is to be like, no, I hate freedom. Yeah, of course people like freedom. Well, you might be a libertarian. Yeah, and that whole thing of like libertarian right and libertarian left, they're just promoting class collaboration there in, in, in the pursuit of, quote, liberty. Okay, if you have class collaboration in pursuit of, quote, liberty, who is going to benefit more from that liberty? Well, the existing ruling class, right? Yeah, so you're just helping capital. You're just participating in your own exploitation. The older I get and see how bleak everything is, the more I think Pol Pot wasn't so wrong with his year zero idea. Uh, he was. No, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. I feel your pain, but no. You gotta keep your eye on the prize. Um, again, capitalism is going through its, its death throes, and it is bleak and miserable. But it, we can do better. That one understanding from Lenin can clear up so much wasted political debate online. The state is a tool of class suppression. Bourgeoisie use it on us, or we use it and do class struggle against them. That's it. Yes, and of course, uh, when we use the state, it has to be a state that we built because it fundamentally will be different in character and in mechanism. You know, I've heard the anti-vax allegations against Jill Stein. I never saw them. I'm not saying that they're not there. It would fit the profile, but I didn't actually read them myself, so I can't say one way or another. But yeah, I mean, she strikes me as exactly the kind of opportunist who would be... In, well, she represents that kind of right contrarian wing of the Green Party. So yeah. All right, it's uh, 2.15 a.m. in Greece, so have a good night. We will definitely see you again. Uh, new to the stream, but I've listened to some of your videos. It expands my leftist views uh, recently. So far, I'm vibing the discussions. Well, good. You know, I think, if nothing else, we try to come off as reasonable here. We have the positions that we have because we've thought it through. And, you know, when new things come up, we consider them and make changes accordingly. Um, we're trying to help improve the left in exactly the way that you're describing. So good. I'm glad that it has expanded your views. That's the whole point. It's expanded my views doing this project. And the more uh, people that can share in that, the better. I think we need a revitalization of the overall movement, of the struggle. Uh, you know, better struggle creates a better vanguard, which is just sort of the leading edge of the most class conscious people within the movement. Uh, some people just... Oh, it's a relative term. Some have more than others. And those people will go on to form the parties and organizations that are going to lead us out of this. It will happen. As a former anarchist, pretty much what I was just saying about anarchism. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I considered anarchism for a while, too. And then I was like, how do anarchists take power? And it was just literally a matter of time after I asked that question. <laughs> that I was like... Oh, this isn't uh, really going anywhere. I did a Zoe Baker criticism video. I did not think Zoe Baker was great, at least from the video I saw, but it was just one video. It was, it was a lot of stuff of hearkening back to what Marx and Engels called primitive communism or hunter-gatherer life, you know, prior to the emergence of surplus and therefore a state. Um... Yeah, but I mean, we, we left that behind long ago. We don't live in hunter-gatherer societies anymore. And so you, you have to actually make a plan that's relevant to this stage of production. So, yeah. But again, I'm not, uh, you know, world's biggest Zoe Baker hater. It's just literally, I just watched that one video. Didn't really see a need to, um, or didn't have an urge to keep watching further. If individuality is the be-all, end-all of revolution, why would a single revolutionary sacrifice their own life for their movement? And quoting Che, shoot me, you coward, you will only be killing a man. Yeah, that's the thing where if you want your anarchism to be social at all, you have to start thinking beyond yourself as an individual and then your 
you've already got a foot in the door towards undermining your anarchism. So, yeah. Have I heard any news about the Nexalites against the BJP in India? I have not. Thank you for bringing that up, though. Um, I'll make a note of that. Nexalite news. When you type that in, you get Nexalite news as a uh, suggested thing. These are the Maoists in India behind various uprisings. I have heard conflicting things that their movement is both shrinking and expanding, and I'm not really sure which is true. Uh, is a revolution when the masses occupy a central building with guns? No. A revolution is when there is a change in who is the ruling class. Uh, how that actually happens is going to differ at different points in time. So... You know, back in Lenin's time with the Russian Revolution, this was prior to the full emergence of like the military industrial complex and the, you know, that kind of standing army apparatus is different today. Um, revolution in some ways would have to be different. It all comes down to mass action, though. It does all come down to mass action. The masses are the deciders of history. Uh, we in the vanguard are trying to provide leadership, and so we seek influence with the masses. Uh, in a partisan way that helps the working class. Um, but in the end, it, it comes down to, do the masses listen to us? What do they want? And, or you know, do they want to keep upholding the status quo? Because it is our work. It's the working class's work that keeps this system going. If we stop tomorrow, the entire system would break. So it's within our power to stop. And nonviolently, the capitalists might freak out and try shooting people. Bottom line is if everyone stopped working, the system would come to a grinding halt and we could have whatever change we want. As long as the masses reject their own power in that situation, uh, they're going to keep perpetuating the system. Or they will look to some source outside of themselves for the solution to how do we stop capitalism. Well, you stop capitalism by stop, you, you stop enacting capitalism. Um, you stop building capital. You stop you know, you, you withhold your labor. It's the only thing that we have, therefore the only thing we can do. So, um, no, you know, what it looks like in the modern world, we don't know because uh, it hasn't happened in quite a while. But if anybody has resources on, you know, theories of revolution in the advanced world, I mean, on that technical level, be an interesting topic. Not to generalize, but I've come across a fair amount of anarchists who fundamentally just don't understand. Well, it is, I think, a, an easy position that a lot of people start out with. Um, it doesn't require any study, and it's just like, I reject all the things I don't like. And there's nothing bad about that impulse, per se, but it can't end there. It can start there, but it can't end there. you got to follow it up with additional um, study. you know, you got to study the history of other movements because you got to realize you're not the first person to have that idea and you know that's where the history 175 uh, years since the communist manifesto was published now uh, 1848 to 2023 so you know we got we got a lot of um, history behind us you got to study that you got to see what worked what didn't work and uh, so yeah you can start with the anarchist impulse of I just want liberation and I you don't have any of the nuance of what that means and how does that relate to class exploitation and so on. But you can't end there because it's just not going to not not in and of itself going to get you a whole lot. Uh, yeah, I've noticed a lot of individualism in anarchism. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what it's about. Yeah. Yeah, speaking about Pol Pot, I mean, Unruh goes into it in that whole video, but um, the, it's, you know, Laos is the most bombed country in history. Cambodia is, you know, not far behind. The U.S. was horrifically brutal um, uh, against Cambodia, so... No one is attending the meetings because they're too crowded. What meetings? Oh, prefiguration, okay, it refers to building structures in the existing bourgeois society that replace and make irrelevant the deteriorating institutions, like the IWW building the, uh, 
the germ of the new world within the shell of the old dying one. Yeah, I mean, communists are not opposed to, like, building the Soviets, for example. Soviets are councils. So you're building a parallel government. Marx and Engels called for that in 1850. Uh, we had this as the pin video. Look up Marx on guns. It's Marx and Engels' address to the Communist League in 1850. They laid out the entire thing there. They're like, after the bourgeoisie takes power, overthrows feudalism, builds a bourgeois state, the proletariat has to build a parallel proletarian government. You will still be uh, not recognized by the bourgeois government, but you got to have your own parallel workers' government. So that's what the Soviets were in Russia. And the Soviets existed prior to the revolution. And yeah, industrial unionism as well. Um, you know, communists working within the trade unions to build up organization, which on day one of the revolution would be ready to step up and take some kind of leadership. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, what we recognize is that revolution, uh, there's a lot of things that are not possible prior to the revolution, although there are some things that are. So yeah, prefiguration, there's nothing like wrong with the concept of doing what you can prior to the revolution. But um, that in and of itself is not going to really be the be all end all. You need to actually um, take control in order, in order to do most of it. Uh, I have no problem with people talking critically about their experiences with anarchists, not at all. I would like to see people outgrow their anarchism and Trotskyism and anything else that doesn't work. Um, and if that was their experience, then that's fine. And, you know, as far as it, quote, not being really useful, I find more people who say that tend to be the anarchists who don't want to hear it, don't want to change. So, yeah. Uh, speaking about the Nexalites, I've also heard conflicting stuff about the uh, Filipino Revolution. Some people say it has entire islands under its control. Others say it just has activity on one island, etc. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not up on that either, but I'll see if I can, when I'm doing the Nexalite stuff, bring up something relevant on that. I mean, getting accurate information on this is not necessarily the easiest thing either, and I don't want to spread inaccurate, uh, inaccurate things. Marxism is a science and we will promote what is best for the masses and work to end the worst for the masses. And yeah, they're either going to listen to us or they're not. So we have to, you know, how do you get anyone to listen to you? How do you get influence with anybody? Trust. You build a relationship with them where you are relevant to their day-to-day -day life. They come to see you as somebody who is trusted that has their best interests in mind that is actually working on their side and is offering useful things. And over time, you know, you gain uh, influence and then they listen to you and then the masses go, hey, these communists are right. We should, you know, <laughs> we should go in that direction. Exactly. Um, you know, I've done various kinds of political action and, and organizing. This is where I wound up after giving it a lot, a lot of thought, like not being able to get it out of my head level of, of thinking about it. So there, you know, it's probably why you're here in this um, chat stream or listening to this on YouTube is you really care and think a lot about this stuff. You're in the vanguard, you know, I mean, you're, you're that part of the working class that is the most class conscious and is actively studying this stuff. Now, most of the working class does not actively study this or not very much, it's in passing. But they still have an interest in the system. They still don't like being exploited. This is basically the difference between the vanguard or not, where this sort of, you know, <laughs> the fanatics uh, to that just kind of are super dedicated to this and, and studying the history and the economic theory. In the end, though, we're just advisors. And, you know, we we lead the working, we, we lead the rest of the working class if we can, if they will listen to us. Um, but uh, ultimately it, it is up to them all right um, we are there so I guess I had uh, more energy than I thought <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and get into some of the CPUSA stuff because th that's actually relevant to what we're talking about here so somebody had asked me about 
hey, what do you know about CPUSA's, quote, Bill of Rights Socialism? And I was like, it sounds like CPUSA, but I don't know specifically. So let's read a thing, and then let's read two criticisms, and we'll probably leave it there for today. Again, this is done in the spirit of improving the left that we have, because it obviously has not gotten us everything that we need so far, and we got to keep improving it and keep building it until we get all the things that we need uh, up to and including social revolution that actually lasts. So um, if, if our current organizations and parties aren't doing it, we got to figure out what the problem is and fix it. So Communist Party USA, this is from their website, Bill of Rights Socialism by Roberta Wood and D. Miles. This is from May 2016, so a few years ago now, almost seven years ago. Uh, we have another article as well. This is the first and shorter one. Socialism is a common sense path to a fairer, more prosperous, and more democratic USA. We make it, and they take it. So this is the we make it part. We make it. Right now, 99% of Americans share the work of producing all the products and services of our economy. We work together in person or online. We work in factories and offices. We work in schools and stores. We work in laboratories and in hospitals. And we work on farms and construction sites. They take it. But when it comes to reaping the rewards of this collective labor, things get turned upside down. What the joint labor of millions of Americans has produced uh, ends up being owned by a handful of billionaires. Those same billionaires, without any say-so or approval by the American people, make all the decisions. That's undemocratic. They get to decide to cut pensions, close schools, ship jobs overseas, and pollute the environment. And yeah, capitalism is a system of one dollar one vote, not one person one vote. It's inherently undemocratic. Most people are never asked, even in a non-binding way, how they want industry to develop, let alone in a binding way. So, so far, so good. A better world is possible. In a socialist economy, things get turned right side up. The ownership and control of the means of production would be in the hands of those who do the work. As a result, those of us who produce, the 99%, would make these important decisions together. This would correspond to the way we produce the wealth together. We must put people and our planet before profits. With the people in the driver's seat, corporate profits would no longer be number one. Instead, the things the American people think are most important would come first. So. In other words, in socialism, we could better reflect the actually existing values of the average working person, uh, not have a society which most people feel is stressful and dystopian, making people really unhappy. We must put, and sick, we must put people and our planet before profits. With the, uh, yeah, that was that. Enough resources would be freed up to do many things. Uh, we could fully fund public education and health care for all. We could have mass transit, social security, free college tuition, and child care. At the same time, we could remove lead from our pipes. We, the American people, could set other priorities, too. I feel like I skipped a line in here. Um, but anyway, we'll continue. It's probably just one line. Socialism equals life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is where I feel like this stuff starts to grate on me. Um... Basically, it, you know, the, the casting of socialism or communism as the fulfilling of the Enlightenment dream or the revolution that the capitalist class won for themselves in overthrowing feudalism but didn't extend to the other classes. Because of the nature of capitalism, they need a large proletariat or propertyless working class to exploit. Who the fuck else is going to work for them? Um, they took life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which originally it did not read the pursuit of happiness. It read the pursuit of property. That should clear some things up for you. So socialism as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness um, for all people, not just the capitalist class. Eh, I don't think that's the best framing of it. Now, I get that they're going for this kind of cringy Americana thing that they often, pub, uh, you know, they often do their propaganda in this vein of, um, you know, socialism is when American values are actually applied to all American people. But the thing is, most people who are at the point where they're interested in socialism just kind of want to scrap this whole system. I mean, in a way, this is a lot of the debate that um, the whole Patsock thing emerged out of in the first place, and CPUSA was pointing out, <clears throat> or sorry, people were pointing out that CPUSA was issuing statements against, say, a Caleb Maupin, 
but they're engaging in a lot of the same kind of um, rhetoric themselves. So it's like, well, you're still doing the kind of, you know, patriotism thing uh, anyway, and they're just sort of trying to put up this, criticize this other guy for doing the same thing that they were doing in some ways. Anyway, enough resources would be freed up to do many things. We could fully fund public education and health care for all. We could have mass transit. Oh, I just read that part. Anyway, derp. Uh, in a socialist society, people would get paid for the hard work that they do. They would be rewarded for the initiatives they take. The difference? Corporate big shots and hedge fund managers could no longer walk up with trillions of dollars that beyond, belong to working families. War, racism, sexism, and homophobia would lose their corporate sponsors. We could apply the full power of American ingenuity and technology to reversing climate change and developing green industries. America's rich and diverse heritage could flourish in music and literature. Sports, dance, film, and art would be available to everyone. Uh, opportunities would open up for millions of young people to contribute their talents and energy. This would result in well-paying and satisfying careers for our nation's youth. Small businesses would have a role to play, would they now, in building this vibrant economy. Tell me something. Uh, what was one of the first things that they found out in trying to build the USSR? was that the petty bourgeoisie was like one of the biggest obstacles. Interesting. Uh, they would be protected from the unfair advantages given to big corporations. Um, yeah, I don't like that at all. Bill of Rights under Socialism. Socialism in the United States would be built on the strong foundation of our Constitution's Bill of Rights. This includes making the promises of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and equality for all real. The rights to a job, to health care and education, must also be guaranteed by the Constitution. The criminal justice, police, and prison systems must be overhauled from top to bottom in order to get rid of racial disparity. Voting rights for people, not for corporations. A fairer political system goes hand in hand with a socialist economy. To work effectively, socialism needs the active and informed participation of the American people. The American people already agree that corporate money must be barred from corrupting our election system. Ten, again, corrupting the election system. I mean, it works for the people it's supposed to work for. Uh, but anyway, 10 million undocumented workers are a part of our country's working class. They must be welcomed to participate as citizens in a socialist democracy. By the same token, the voting rights of millions of incarcerated Americans, mostly African Americans and Latinos, must be restored. In place of voter suppression laws, fair election processes are needed. Universal voter participation is the basis of democracy. They're really putting a lot of emphasis on this. And I feel like this goes hand in hand with the sort of naive, naivete that they promote about vote against fascism, etc. U.S. elections are a fucking joke. Like, they're not real. Okay, so... Um, Anyway, in both open and hidden ways, racial inequality and sexism are built into the structure of our nation's capitalist economy and society. Rooting it out is a task for the entire American people. That's the only way we can build the unity that we need. It is this unity that will give us the power to build a just and democratic society for every one of us and for future generations. A socialist society also needs checks and balances. Organizations at the grassroots level. I'm just wondering, like, who is this written for? Um, again, I feel like most people interested in socialism are looking to more or less sweep away what we have now, not like improve it. And the people who are interested idealistically in improving the current uh, system are pretty thoroughly anti-communist. It just it seems very odd to me, but uh, organizations at the grassroots level can make sure that there are democratic controls. Our country already has great traditions of grassroots organizations. Town hall meetings, tribal councils, uh, tribal councils, and you're including that in our country. Um, I, I have some technical questions about that, but anyway. And student governments. All right, student governments. Our working class has gained valuable experience in operating labor unions, cooperatives, and credit unions. At a local level, Americans contribute their talents in PTAs, churches, and charitable organizations. Uh, we have a vision. Building on this expertise and experience, Americans can have the confidence that together we can build a political and economic system of the people, by the people, and for the people. The unity of America's working people, African American and white, Latino, Asian, Indian, and Middle Eastern is critical to our progress. Men and women, LGBTQ and straight, young and old must stand together for each other. This unity cannot be broken if it is based 
on the working class principle of an injury to one is an injury to all. This is a, our vision of a socialist USA. You can join with us, help make this vision a reality. Now, granted, this is from 2016. That's the end. Um, yeah, again, it's it's the, the Americana stuff I find cringe because the people, it seems to me like, who tend to most be into that stuff or tend to be the least interested in uh, major, major changes. Is this just effective, um, you know, strategy? I mean, I had the one thing about the small businesses that I really kind of fundamentally agree with just on a Marxist level. The rest of this for me is this sort of like, who are you appealing to writing this? That said, it's not technically incorrect in a lot of ways, but um, I kind of, I mean, I want to say kind of boring. Um, it's, you know, as agitation, it sucks. Um, and it seems to me like digging into... Digging into this sort of, uh, you know, Americana and like that vague patriotism of American aesthetics and the quote American way of life. I don't know. Aren't people who are into that stuff kind of too comfortable to even consider a communist revolution? Uh, so anyway, the, the tone strikes me as odd, even if a lot of it is technically not incorrect. Um, yes, eventually, like a lot of, you know, normies would have to uh, support um, the the kind of change that socialists are pushing for. It seems to me, though, that agitating out of specific problems people are having rather than this sort of the positive aspects of Americana seems more the pathway forward. But anyway, leaving that for what it is, there's another article, Bill of Rights, Socialism and the Future of the Republic by Brad Crowder from December 8, 2020. So um, there was a, let's see, Bill of Rights Socialism was first put forward by Gus Hall, chairman of the Communist Party in the Communist Party USA in his 1990 pamphlet, The American Way to Bill of Rights Socialism. How's that working out, by the way? Emil Shaw wrote in 1996 that Bill of Rights Socialism, quote, conveys the idea that we will incorporate U.S. traditions into the structure of socialism that the working class will create. No doubt, like, there may still be a PTA or, like, something like that. I mean, or the, at least the the principle of it. But, um, I don't know, it strikes me that this is way out of step with uh, the actual building of support at this particular stage of things. So, anyway, um, and again, I know that that's a bit vague. It's meant to be a bit vague. This is, I'm um, sort of chewing on this at the moment. Anyway, since then, the CPUSA has continued to deepen and expand this theory to correspond with the real needs of struggle. Uh, <clears throat> they're not alone in this project. Other communist parties have also been applying Marxism-Leninism creatively to produce important innovations, bringing socialist construction into the modern age, while also adapting their own path to their unique national conditions. So this article is kind of long. It gets kind of technical, and I don't really have time to get into it, but I wanted to at least mention Yes, there's still kind of writing about this topic. That said, I'd like to skip ahead to the criticism uh, because, again, all of this sort of, you know, the proud traditions of the U.S. public, who does this go over with and what would it take to convince those people of communist revolution? Are these the first people you should be sort of, like, working on? There's just a lot of questions that come up for me. Anyway, um, turning for a moment to Cosmonaut, which is uh, another journal, they have this article that happened to cross my desk today, Socialism with American Characteristics, which is a criticism of uh, CPUSA. I may not actually have time to get to the Politsturm article. Maybe we can do that in the future. But let's see what we can get here and then close out with some chat. Uh, so Luke Pickrell and Myra Janis critique the 2019 updated party program of the Communist Party USA, arguing that CPA, CPUSA's <coughs> continued commitment to the popular front produces an unwieldy document incapable of charting a strategic path forward for socialists. Boy, I'll say, the popular front expired with, at the very latest, with McCarthyism. Okay, so late 1940s, early 1950s, um, after World War II was won with the help of communists, the capitalists completely turned on communists. It was the Cold War internationally, and it was the Red Scare 
domestically. Any illusions of a popular front beyond that point are just completely unfounded. It could be criticized as opportunist um, even earlier than that, although you know the Comintern had the policies that it had and CPUSA did what it did. Um, but I mean, that's, we're, we're, that's, for, that's for another time. But the idea of after McCarthyism still promoting the popular front to defeat fascism. So first of all, what's a popular front? Popular front, and you can find texts about this from Georgi Dimitrov uh, on the channel. Popular front is an idea that um, basically uh, communists should align with other non-communist proletarian parties as well as some anti-fascist petty bourgeois and uh, bourgeois parties that were willing to go to war with fascism. So that was the popular front. The united front, by contrast, is just an alliance with proletarian elements, uh, you know, communists, uh, which are obviously proletarian, aligning with non-communist proletarian elements, but not with the bourgeoisie, even if they say that they're anti-fascist. Okay, so CPUSA is basically out there pushing this line that you got to vote against fascism, Democrats like hold your nose and do it, et cetera, et cetera, basically delaying and preventing the break from the Democratic Party that needs to happen. Because the Democratic Party works hand in glove, it's good cop, bad cop, with the Republican Party. The Democrats first took the presidency in 1828. They've been around this entire time. And let me tell you, they are not participating in this imaginary popular front that CPUSA continues to make reference to. They're not interested, she, you know, they're not into you. Like, it's not reciprocated. So all this is, is opportunism, and it's just feeding communists towards a dead-end political party. It's the same thing that we criticize Bernie Sanders for doing, um, feeding people who are willing to rally for social, social change into a political party which not only will not deliver it, but actively stands in the way of it constantly. And uh, when it comes to the Republican Party, some of the Democratic Party will rightfully call it fascist, and they will even pretend to be against it. But here's the thing, if the Democratic Party really wanted to shatter and destroy the Republican Party, they could by aligning with the left. But how did they treat Bernie Sanders, which was a massive mobilization of broad left forces uh, within the context of the Democratic Party. They treated him like literally Hitler. Okay. Well, so I don't think that they're really interested in working with the left. In fact, Joe Biden's whole thing was we got, we shit on the left's head and we still won anyway. We don't need the left. Then what happened in the midterms? Yeah, oops. But they don't care. Their p purpose is to perpetuate the system, which is exactly what they keep doing. And um, they need the Republicans to do that. They need good cop, bad cop. Both of them are funded by the same 1% rich interests. So why are you supporting the Democratic Party, which is completely controlled by 1% money and always will be? It's not a suitable space for uh, ideological struggle. Uh, they're anti-communist. They're, they're not reciprocating your desire for a popular front. Joe Biden just literally told you the exact fucking opposite. It's pathetic tailism. It's tail you're tailing people who don't even want you to tail them. It's that fucking sad. So anyway, um, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of good rank and file members in CPUSA who joined and are in there for six months or a year or a couple of years, and they're trying to do what they can within the party. I'm talking about the long entrenched leadership of CPUSA, which has been holding lines like this for a very long time. So let's read, and that'll be kind of the end of today's stream. Uh, introduction, the Communist Party of the United States, CPUSA, celebrated its 100th anniversary uh, and signs would appear to augur well for the organization in the coming years. Recently, the party discussed running candidates for office. Membership numbers are rising and the party credits itself and its allies for the broad front that defeated Donald Trump in the 2020 presidential election. Look, no one listens to CPUSA outside of CPUSA members. That's just a fact, okay? No one's like, I'm undecided. I'm not a CPUSA member, but what does CPUSA have to say? No one does that. Taking credit for that is just absurd and, again, kind of sad and desperate. 
So, anyway. Having abandoned the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, an organization in a crisis of political direction, we've covered the crisis within DSA recently, uh, look back to the previous live streams, um, and gazed upon the desolate expanse that is revolutionary socialism in the United States. Indeed, it is greatly in need of, of a revitalization, uh, one we're hoping to contribute to, because if we don't, well, what's the alternative? Some comrades have turned away from the red rose toward the tried and true hammer, sickle, and gear. Unfortunately, these comrades will not have escaped the politics of class collaborationism by fleeing DSA and may find themselves in even hotter water. By the way, I often say, get to know your local left, find out what's going on around you. If DSA is the only thing, do get involved with it, network with people. The idea is not that DSA is going to be the be-all, but that you meet people through that, you find out what else is going on, things that I don't know about and can't recommend to you, but you can find out through getting involved in your local left. And while you're in DSA, fight for the left wing of it. It can only help because if DSA ever does split and the left wing of it breaks off, overnight that would be the biggest socialist organization in the country. That said, uh, DSA has been led by, quote, moderate or right-leaning leadership that advocates collaboration with the Democratic Party constantly. Major problem, that's a major dead end. And if you're in it, fight against it while you're doing your networking and finding out what is going on in your area. And the other thing I, you know, I've said to people, uh, I almost rather see people join DSA over CPUSA for the purposes I just mentioned, because at least DSA does not have the pretense of being communist. CPUSA, on the other hand, will tell you to collaborate with the Democratic Party. Um, what's their excuse? You know what I'm saying? So you at least know what you're getting into more with DSA. Uh, it's Big Tent. It is what it is. And, you know, I've uh, tried to clarify this uh, time and time again. To be fair, I think people are finally understanding what I've been trying to say with that. But all right. So the CPUSA marked its centenary with an updated version of the party platform, The Road to Socialism USA. Reading through the document is daunting, an astounding 61 pages long. It meanders across 10 disorganized primary sections and dozens of subsections. Boundaries are porous. The introduction contains a conclusion, ideas repeat, and lists of occasionally intriguing demands are relegated to side sidebars. Friedrich Engels' critique of the German Social Democratic Party's Erfurt program, quote, the fear that a short pointed exposition would not be intelligible enough, has caused explanations to be added which make it verbose and drawn out, applies just as accurately to the CPUSA. These comrades, hoping to attract as large an audience as possible, and that's kind of what I was saying about that last article. I was like, who are you trying to appeal to? Um, in hoping to attract as large an audience as possible, have thrown everything but the kitchen sink toward the proverbial wall in a desperate attempt to make some things stick. Asked to accept the program, one struggles for solid footing. How can one determine agreement with such an incomprehensible document? But determination brings rewards. Cutting through girth and clearing away the tired abstractions, injustice, a better world, the 1%, epic struggles, the greed of the few, fascism, reveals two fundamental flaws, a commitment to the decades-old People's Front policy of alliances with anything left of the extreme right, and dedication to the Constitution, uh, let me add, no matter how anti-communist it is, and dedication to the Constitution and the parameters of the capitalist state. In other words, socialism with American characteristics. What follows, and again, Caleb Maupin was rightly criticized, not just for appearing at neo-fascist conferences, in 2018 with Alexander Dugan, for example, uh, but for pushing this kind of stuff as well. Uh, where were we? Dedication to the Constitution, in other words, socialism with American characteristics. What follows is an elaboration on these two flaws. While the comrades in the CPUSA may be motivated by a genuine desire to fight for the interests of the working class, their program provides no path forward and opens the door to opportunistic zigzags and the internal rule of bureaucrats. Continuing the People's Front. This is far from an exhaustive chronicle of the ups and downs of the Communist Party, a job that E.J. Hobsbawm described as presenting unique difficulties. Rather, and there's footnotes throughout this. Uh, rather, reading the CPUSA program allows one to reflect on the rise and fall of American communism and the world socialist movement more generally. 
At its height, the party contributed several victories to the class struggle in the United States. It carried out exceptional work in organizing the unemployed during the Great Depression, and it defended the Scottsboro Boys when the NAACP refused. The party's victories in states such as Alabama and New York are well documented. The United Front strategy, how the party relates to the political institutions of the capitalist state to win members and strengthen the fighting power of the working class, began during a period of global defeat for communism. Having emerged victorious from the Russian Civil War, the newly formed Third International, or Common Turn, Communist International, expected a quick succession of civil wars and communist victories across Europe. But soon after, defeats in Germany, Poland, and Hungary I would add also missed opportunity in Italy, augured ill. The working masses had not rallied behind the banner of the communist parties, and the Bolsheviks were left isolated in Russia. After fending off his ultra-left detractors, Lenin oversaw the entry of the communist parties into alliances with non-communist working class political forces, including social democratic parties, under the explicit condition of retaining organizational independence and freedom to criticize the reformist leadership. In theory, the United Front was sound. Principled alliances with reformist parties were scrapped when Stalin came to power. Um, I mean, let's continue, but the communists had zigged right only to zag left during the third period of 1928 to 1933. The People's Front, America's version of the Popular Front, began a final lurch back to the right in 1935 in the context of impending war and the rise of German Nazism. Ben Rose described the People's Front as a, quote, <clears throat> gradual shift toward a search for alliances and influence with the leadership of organizations believed to be instrumental in fighting domestic and international fascism, as well as those capable of pressuring the Roosevelt administration, unquote. Tactical alliances with a section of the capitalist class subordinated working class independence to the goals of capitalists. The goal of socialism in America was abandoned, and in 1937, the party dropped its slogan toward a Soviet America. The day-to-day -day practice of fighting for reforms submerged the goal of a classless society and socialism with American characteristics, socialism, after all, being just as American as baseball and apple pie, became the norm. As Mike McNair explains, quote, official communist and Maoist parties committed themselves to rejection of the most elementary Marxist principle. What are we talking about Maoist parties in 1937? So this is, again, I'm not uh, totally on board with these people, but it's an interesting read. I'm not really sure what they're talking about there. Um, the independent political organization and representation of the working class in favor of democratic, unquotes, coalitions, which repeat the projects Marx and Engels fought against or worse in favor of coalition for national independence, which support the word working class to the party of order. Okay, I mean, let's let's also again consider the context of World War II being right around the corner. Um, again, read Dimitrov because I think it's fairly clear uh, why a lot of this happened. But anyway, uh, in other words, they're over more critical of that than I would be. Although the abandoning towards the Soviet America for just the reforms, that's inexcusable, and was fought against. Um, you know, you could say whether he was just the loyal opposition or not, but it was fought against by William Z. Foster and other elements um, within CPUSA, even at the time. But continuing, the call for a people's front continues today. In the name of fighting the extreme right, a nefarious entity that is inadequate and incompetent and backward one moment and fascist the next, I'm not really sure where that criticism is coming from, but anyway. Uh, the program urges unity with all progressive forces in defeating the extreme right's implicit and explicit drive toward fascism. That's a quote. Divisions within the capitalist class, quote, contain opportunities for working class and progressive forces. On some issues, the more moderate, more realistic sections of the capitalist class and their political operatives move parallel to the people's movements as important through... Uh, Oh, as important, though partial and temporary allies. They can be pressured to adopt a more progressive stance by the strength of the people's movements and mass sentiment, unquote. The program encourages alliances with the Democratic Party because it is, quote, not identical with the Republican Party, which when you really step back and just look at that, that's a bad reason. 
The Democratic Party's history, the, quote, main vehicle used by African-American and Latino communities to gain representation, as well as the main mechanism used to elect labor, progressive, and even left activists to public office, unquote, supposedly, I'll say mostly in the past, but whatever, um, or at least some of that mostly in the past, particularly the labor um, activists, uh, supposedly demonstrates differences with its elephant brother. Furthermore, alleged rifts within the party can be used to workers' advantage. One reads, quote, There exists an internal struggle within the Democratic Party among centrist forces who collaborate with the right wing. I'm sorry, if people are still calling the Democratic Party centrist, they are just, it's irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever else they're probably going to have to say about that particular topic. Um, Democrats are right wing. Anyway, uh, there are centrist forces who co collaborate with the right wing, centrist forces opposed to the right wing, and more progressive, even socialist trends, unquote. Any desire to build a mass party must bow to the existing facts of the power of the capitalist state and the constitutional regime. With friends like these, dot, 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 calls for an alliance with the Democratic Party and the NGO complex against the far right are equivalent to asking the fox to guard the hen house. I wouldn't even say it's asking a different colored. Uh, well, OK, but um, really, the Democrats and Republicans, they're they are part of the same system and funded by the same people. So, yeah, anyway, the fox eats its plump ward every time. Such proposals are the equivalent of trusting the bourgeoisie of the French Third Republic to eradicate the threat of a clerical monocle Thermidorian reaction. I'm sure most people are not going to get that, uh, but they threw it in. Anyway, during the Third Republic, the proletariat was lured away from independent politics by liberals who incessantly hollered about a grave threat to the Republic as justification for uniting under one banner. With danger knocking at the door, this was no time to wage the class struggle. How often do we hear that today? Karkowski explained the reality behind the facade. Quote, the bourgeois liberal politicians have, have every interest in the struggle against the church, but no, by no means in triumphing over it. They can only count on an alliance of the proletariat as long as this struggle continues, unquote. So, yeah, I mean, that's the bourgeoisie kept around elements of feudal reaction in order to shore up their power. Ultimately, a definitive victory is illusory. The imperative to unite against a bigger bad never ends. How ironic that the Communist Party now advocates politics far to the right of those espoused by Second International Marxism's famous pope-turned-renegade during his period as a revolutionary thinker. So, by the way, people are confused about Kautsky there. Um, I think this is coming from the uh, maybe the Marxist Unity Caucus of DSA, which I've read their recommended reading list. There's a ton of Mike McNair, who they just made reference to, and a ton of, like, old Kautsky. Before Kautsky turned and endorsed World War I and all that stuff, Kautsky was regarded even by Lenin as, like, really good. They're for some reason like huge fans of old Kautsky, and that's kind of where the list stops in a way. So I, th I think that that's where Co Cosmonaut is coming from. Um, continuing, I'm probably going to skip to the end after this paragraph uh, or two. The Democratic Party is more concerned with maintaining the rule of law than prosecuting an effective campaign against an increasingly right wing and authoritarian Republican Party and its hangers-on. See, for example, their impotent attempt to understand and resolve the events of January 6, 2022. Well, they just wanted to fundraise off of that. Compared to, not that it wasn't a danger, but that they just, they just fundraise off of stuff. They don't fix any problems. Compared to their focus on the chauvinistic conspiracy theory of Russiagate, the state's repressive apparatus is far more concerned with countering perceived threats from the left than from the right. So again, they're not interested in reciprocating this popular front. Skipping down, the CPUSA program describes the All People's Front as a, quote, essential strategy for this historical period, not just a temporary tactic, unquote. This puts socialism as something always in the distant future, a goal to pursue after the present task is complete. Yet, like Sisyphus and his boulder, the task is never concluded, and All People's Front will not permanently defeat the far right. Look at World War II. Only a socialist republic can eliminate the excrement produced by capitalism in decline, fascism, and only a socialist political party can make a new republic a reality. Okay, so let's just skip to the end here. Um, 
Today, the Communist Party USA rests upon a mixed historical legacy marked by moments in which it acted as a vanguard of the working class in the highest sense of the phrase, about 80 years ago, as well as a long period in which it continues to be plagued by the lowest possible opportunism. In criticizing its present class collaborationist platform, we hope to provide a resource to those in the Communist Party chafing under this orientation, and I agree. As in the democratic socialists of America, the time has come for genuine communists to rebel against the dominant opportunism of the largest organizations of the working class political movement in the United States. We encourage Marxists in the Communist Party USA to begin openly discussing the course and future of their party and the entire socialist movement. The pages of Cosmonaut are open to them, and replies from defenders of the Communist Party's current orientation are welcome as well, if only to train the arguments of their critics. May the rebels prevail. And there's contact information at the bottom. So we're going to leave it there. Um, I will check in with the chat briefly. And uh, this is an ongoing topic. We will, again, come back to this with other criticisms of CPUSA. It's an important thing because CPUSA has a lot of members, and a lot of them really are talented people who are frustrated with uh, the leadership in their organization, yet nobody seems to know how to get a handle on it and change it. Anyway, it's something we're going to have to figure it out, and we will do that. So thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. I would make content even if nobody paid, but uh, I'm allowed to spend a lot more time on it through that support. I'm afforded a lot more time than I can, uh, than I can spend on it. Uh, let's scroll back up to where... Uh, where did we leave off? Okay, there we go. I see Zoe Baker. Let's scroll down. All right. Um, the Filipino state has always been saying that the NPA, New People's Army, will fall in two more weeks, and the NPA has always been saying that they will enter strategic stalemate in just a few more years. I mean, that said, whatever you want to say about the co Filipino communists, they've gotten a lot farther than a lot of people, uh, a lot of other groups have. So we we will see. Uh, we will see. How would you go about building a workers' counselor party? Personally, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, that's just not a position that I'm in to, to do. Um, you know, again, uh, well, anyway, I, I, let's, let's come back to that at, at another time. But personally, that's not really on the agenda for me right now. However, um, as always, these things are up to the masses and as led by the vanguard. If people don't even get out and interact with their left such as it is, the unions, the political parties, you know, self-styled progressives, and kind of network, separate the wheat from the chaff, um, you know, make your contacts, and then eventually, maybe in a, another couple of years, something can come out of that when the right um, situation arises. I mean, I guess that's what I would say, but I don't think we're particularly close to that right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear of this whole process, and rightly so. The United States is scary. At the same time, though, we have to push forward knowing that what we're doing is correct. I just stumbled on this stream. Welcome. I think subbing to Chapo Trap House added to that. Bernie really got me into left-leaning politics in 2016. I've learned a lot since then, but seeing how bleak and shitty everything is... Now, I just can't see our economic system ever changing, at least not without mass death and suffering beforehand. Well, we want to keep the mass death and suffering to a minimum. That's going to be what the capitalists bring. Uh, the more quickly we get our shit together, the less of that there's going to be. But go to the channel, uh, YouTube Socialism for All, and listen to the audiobooks. I think you will find uh, more revolutionary optimism in there that can pull you out of some of that bleakness. Yeah, why would we need to protect small businesses? It's like they're kind of pandering to not the most progressive elements of U.S. society there, for sure. This reads like a high school kid trying to write up an essay the night before it's due. I kind of thought the same thing, to be totally honest. And, like, obviously, I mean, it's reasonably well written and it hits the major points. It's just not that good, you know? Yeah, that was CPUSA, yeah. It is it's hella boring. This is a dumb... Okay, yeah. Um, 
on small businesses isn't one of the biggest workers issue wages if it's well known that small businesses can't compete with big business when it comes to giving them a minimum wage uh, there you go the needs of workers and small business owners are contradictory to one another their gain is our loss we are the 90 percent yeah um, I mean ultimately small business owners they may be they may have smaller teams of lawyers and they may be more feckless than the big capitalists um, you know I've worked for my share of small businesses and you know, yeah, they can definitely be shitty. Sometimes, though, you have more leeway because they um, are, they don't know what they're doing as much. Like, in a way, it's almost easier to outsmart them sometimes <laughs> and, like, kind of get what you want. It depends. Um, you know, a lot of them, they started a business, like, they're not that good at it and so on, versus going up against a big corporate machine. So there's, you know, advantages and disadvantages. The bottom line is that capitalism ruins all the petty bourgeoisie anyway. So, I mean, like, uh, as far as, you know, communists being like, we're going to protect small business. What? I mean, <laughs> just the progression of development, like, puts them out of business. So, anyway. It's socialism with American characteristics. Damn, literally said that the second I typed it out. Yeah, exactly. So, this, I mean, this is what they're going for. And, uh... It was just mayoral elections here in Chicago. By the way, Lori Lightfoot is out one-term mayor. First one-term mayor in 40 years. I, I did see that. But I kept hearing how small businesses were the backbone of Chicago. Yeah, right. Workers are cut the BS. Uh, workers are cut the BS. There we go. All right. Punctuation is our friend. Um, but yeah, I hear you. I mean, no, the, the masses are the backbone of Chicago and all of society. Uh, petty bourgeoisie are just the, um, you know, lowest tier of exploiters. And, you know, there's there's movement back and forth sometimes between the proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie. Not as much as in past eras. There's still a little bit. It's mostly downward at this point. Um, you know, you get some petty bourgeoisie who realize that they just kind of got lucky for a while and they'll be back to being a working stiff eventually. Those people, you know, it depends, I think, where you've spent the predominant amount of time working. You know, have you been a small business owner or have you been an employee? And that's probably going to, you know, people have spent more time as a small business owner, been relatively more successful with it. They're probably more likely to think of themselves as like, you know, temporary, temporarily embarrassed billionaire or whatever. Whereas, you know, ones who have been employees as well are probably a bit more grounded in, uh, this is, again, probabilities, not every last person. If you want to read a book that uh, goes into the, oh, there's a whole debate about free speech for fascists. Uh, we need real MLs to split from CPUSA. So that was the point of PCUSA, Party of Communist USA, and then they ran into a lot of problems as well. Um... So, yeah, it's the question of where do you go from that point? Uh, you know, the people are, do we change CPUSA or do they split? Well, the split was tried and then they had a lot of these kind of like, you know, uh, Patsaki, Nazbali type problems, um, among other things. I was not impressed with CPUSA or PCUSA was pretty active when I was starting S4A. I was not impressed with the way that they were uh, interacting. So, um yeah. Um, as far as splitting, you need somewhere good to go. And uh, that is something still emerging. Uh, like I said, I, I would I would give Paul at Sturm a, a serious look, at least at this point, uh, if people really are looking for something. Uh, or, you know, can you change CPUSA? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I think the, the jury is out at this point. There is a CPUSA video called Why We Don't Quote Stalin and Mao, and it gave some BS about socialism different in national conditions. Yeah, I think I remember that. Um, it's bad. I mean, we've covered a lot of CPUSA stuff. Most of it is not great. I, see, I don't see a lot of quality comrades staying in that party for super long. It's almost as if any left-wing org in the U.S. is either fully dead or an FBI entrapment. Um... 
I mean, it's not an inspiring roster for the most part, although some of them have more problems reported than others do. I can say that. But um, overall, the way that I think we're going to get out of this situation is by more people doing the study, fighting for correct positions, and waging relentless ideological struggle against those who push revisionism and all, all this other crap. Yeah, I mean, Maoism proper wasn't a thing until, like, <laughs> much later. I think they were talking about, like, people who just like Mao, but even then, like, yeah, that definitely wasn't a thing. That was a very strange uh, statement. Sadly, in France, the actual leader of the traditional Communist Party, F. Roussel, is kind of a red-brown joke here, almost Islamophobic, telling us to eat meat and pro-liberal shit, uh, not saying the terms about the class struggle. <clears throat> we really hope of a better convergence between the different left parties for our next elections. That, again, I'm calling for the exact same thing, is left coalition. I think that people need to form a left coalition out of... None of the parties is very big in the United States. Uh, Dem exit to left coalition. And read, read your goddamn Marxist texts, you know, so that you know what you're doing. Since we are on the topic of revisionist communist parties, <clears throat> can you cover CPB? What is... Oh, CP... Britain's Road to Socialism. Okay, I will take a look at that. Didn't PCUSA start hooking up with the Pat Sox? I don't know. I really haven't seen much... I know there's a few people in PCUSA who, like, message me from time to time. Most of them have been reasonably, reasonably polite. Um... They had a big scandal kind of a few years ago with the guy they were running for Congress. I thought the behavior of the party was despicable around that. Um, that cemented them in my mind as kind of a, a ridiculous joke. And my understanding is there's one guy who runs like all of uh, PCUSA, Angelo D Angelo D'Angelo. And uh, like when people started criticizing that situation around their congressional candidate a few years ago, they literally just like deleted their Discord server so people couldn't talk about it. I mean, it's just pathetic behavior. And then another group split off, the American Council of Bolsheviks, which they describe as a pre-party formation. Um, there's like 10 people in it. So it's, you know, it's not very big. And that's why I say, you know, overall left coalition. If people want to form their like study groups and stuff like that, you know, totally fine. But um, I think calling things a party when it is really more of like a reading and discussion group is not really helping anyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear the least bad things about PSL, but there's definitely things reported about them as well. Uh, you know, me sticking my head back in the Brian Becker thing because he is both a co-founder of PSL and the national director of Answer, made me realize, like, oh, so there's a ton of, like, uh, revisionism going on there as well. So I don't know. But um, on that note, you know, got to keep fighting. Uh, we will keep up the studies. We will keep pushing. And we'll probably begin the next stream with some of this other stuff that we left off from the Politsturm criticism of CPUSA, uh, etc. And um, I don't know, I'm tired. We've been streaming for like four hours at this point, so my mind is starting to wander. I need a break. Uh, PSL Neo Brezhnevites. So yeah, I mean, it's like uh, I haven't really heard of an org that hasn't had substantial criticisms of them at this point. So, you know, like I said. Um, the next thing we, we are, well actually I don't know if it's the next thing, but we are going to do Again, probably a bi-monthly, uh, uh, or again, every other month, um, we're going to be doing a COVID update. So we got that coming up. 
and uh, more streaming, more audiobooks, more of the things that we are doing. So I appreciate you all showing up, and that is it for Livestream 85.